Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the eighth meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Uh, can I welcome uh, members, uh, welcome uh, guests joining us in the gallery, and can I remind everyone please to turn off, or at least turn to silent, all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. We have apologies this morning from uh, Dennis Robertson, and we are joined uh, by Bruce Crawford, a substitute, and I'd also like to welcome Cara Hilton, who's here as the constituency member for Dunfermline for uh, item number four on the agenda. Now, item one on the agenda, can I ask if members are uh, agreed that we take item five in private? Is that agreed? Thank you. Item uh, two on the agenda, we have to consider a piece of subordinate legislation, the Common Financial <laughs> Tool, etc. Amendment Regulations uh, 2015. I'd like to welcome uh, this morning the Minister for Parliamentary Business, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, who's joined by uh, Graham Fisher, Head of Branch 1, Constitutional and Civil Law Division at the Scottish Government, and Chris Boyland, Head of Strategic uh, Reform at the Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Minister, do you want to say something to introduce this instrument? Yes, thank you, um, Kavinar. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, the aim of the regulations is to allow debtors entering into any Scottish statutory debt solution to retain a contingency allowance, that's 10% of their disposable income subject to a maximum of £20 per month or equivalent, and that's as a buffer against unforeseen expenses. The £20 maximum amount was discussed by and agreed by stakeholders, members of our Common Financial Tool Working Group. The group agreed that this amount struck the best balance between the needs of the debtors and the interests of the creditors. The need to make this provision now arises because, as you know, the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014, which this committee examined in detail, mandates the use of a single common financial tool for all statutory debt solutions in Scotland. The regulations um, being amended require the tool used to be the Common Financial Statement, or CFS, which is available freely under licence from the Money Advice Trust. The CFS is due to be replaced by a new tool, the Standard Financial Statement, it was hoped this replacement would happen before the 1st of April and include a contingency allowance, so this could simply be built into the new tool. But as things stand, the new standard financial statement won't be introduced on time, so we're making this provision now in order that the debtors can benefit at the same, <coughs> excuse me, at the same time as the other 2014 Act changes come into force. This move has been supported by stakeholders such as Citizens Advice Scotland, who have called it, and I quote, a sensible step which will allow those paying off debts to be able to save a small amount of money each month. The regulations also take opportunity to make some minor technical uh, clarifications and improvements, and I hope that clarifies the purpose of um, the regulations, and my officials and myself would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, are any members wishing to ask any questions in relation to this? Uh, Mr Brody. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just very briefly, in the, in the covering note, um, we had some contention around whether there should be one tool or two tools, but okay, we have the common financial tool. It says that you can add a contingency allowance to the, to the CFT under the CFT regulations within defined limits. Who's going to define the limits? What limits are we talking about? Well, the, the defined limits. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Chris, do you want to Sorry, Chris. Yeah, the <coughs> limits are defined in the regulations as the amount that can be retained by way of contingency, which is uh, £20 a month if you're paying monthly. It works out at slightly different sums if you're paying, for example, if you're paying weekly. Um, but those are the, uh, the limits, I think, to which you're referring. So, so those, those limits were agreed by partners <coughs> as being at that balance between the interests of the debtor and the interests of the creditors. Okay. That's why it was arrived at. Thank you, Mr. And, and just one other question: the, the, there have been minor clarifications and corrections, minor, in response to the uh, ICAS. Uh, can you give an indication how minor these are? I ask Graham for sure. to. Yes, I mean, we can, can definitely say that these are these are technical minor amendments. A lot of them pick up minor typographical points. I mean, part of the the process in bringing forward these regulations is to, was to bring them in early so that there was enough time to, to make the, the adjustments necessary before the 1st of April and, and that's what we've done. We've also picked up some minor points that the, de the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee have, have raised and we've made all, all of those changes in time for 1st of April. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other members wish to ask any questions? Uh, nope. 
Okay, well in that case we can move to item 3, which is the uh, formal debate uh, on the motion. I invite you, Minister, if you would, to formally move uh, the uh, motion uh, that we approve the Common Financial Tool, etc. Amendment Regulations 2015. Formally moved. Formally moved, thank you. Do any members wish to speak in relation to the motion? Okay, if not, I think we can move straight to uh, the vote. And the question is the motion S4M12561 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask members if I can have your consent uh, to delegate responsibility for the drafting and publication of a short factual report uh, to the convener and clerk? Is that agreed? Yeah. That is agreed. Uh, Minister, thank you to you and your officials for attending. We'll now have a short suspension until I have a changeover. Thank you. Okay, we're at item four on the agenda. Uh, the committee agreed that we would take some evidence on the issue in relation to Longanet Power Station in Fife and the uh, press speculation there has been around the early closure of Longanet on the broader question of security of supply. Uh, and the committee has agreed that we want to do a, a broader piece of work on this, but because of the um, urgency of the Longanet situation, we felt a one-off evidence session specifically on this would be very useful and that would also help inform uh, our wider uh, discussions to come at a, a slightly later date. So I'd like to welcome this morning our, our panel of witnesses. We have uh, Jim Smith, who's Managing Director, Energy Portfolio Management, Scottish and Southern Energy, and Neil Clitheroe, who's the CEO of Retail and Generation at Scottish Power, Mike Calvio, who's Director of Transmission Network Service from National Grid, and Martin Crouch, Senior Partner of Transmission at Ofgem. Welcome to you all and thank you for uh, coming along. Now, we have about uh, 90 minutes for this panel. After that, we've got a second panel uh, from Fife Council to talk about some of the local economic development issues um, that might arise from uh, the closure of Longanet. But this issue is, is looking at the, the plant itself and uh, some of the broader uh, strategic issues around uh, energy policy that affect its future. Um, now, um, I think we're going to just go straight into questions. I would ask members, if they're asking questions, please to keep their questions as short and to the point <laughs> as possible. And if we can have answers that are as short and to the point as possible, that would be useful in getting through the topics we want to cover in the time available. 
<clears throat> and because we've got a panel of four, uh, I think it would be helpful if, if you don't all try and answer every question, otherwise we'll be here for quite a long time. Uh, so I'd encourage members if they would direct their questions at a particular panel member. And uh, if you want to come in and respond to a question addressed to somebody else, if you just catch my eye, I'll do my best to bring you in as time allows. I wonder if I could maybe start and address this question initially to, to, to yourself, Mr. Mr. Clitheroe. Um, there's been a lot of press speculation um, over the past few weeks about um, the future of Longanet. Um, now, we've always known that the likelihood is Longanet would have to close by 2020 because of a combination of factors, um, EU emissions directives, uh, carbon pricing, and so on. Um, but the, the, the speculation ha has been recently that uh, the closure may have to be brought forward. There's also been um, speculation in the press about discussions you've been having with National Grid. So I want to hear from National Grid shortly, but I wonder if you can just tell me exactly where we are today with Longanet and what is the position. Uh, and given a, a lot of our concern is for the workers at Longanet, what future do they have as things currently stand? Okay. Well, you know, as we're all aware, Longanet's been at the heart of Scottish generation for the last 40 years. It was actually opened in, in March 1973. Uh, coincidentally, a month after I was born, um, and has provided provided generation through that whole time. It actually is able to provide 40% of Scotland's peak demand needs, uh, generates over 10 terawatt hours a year, and, and, uh, and basically uh, represents about 20% of all Scottish generation. So it's a it's a pivotal plant right in the right in the centre of of Scotland. Um, over a number of years, um, the pressure on coal plant um, has has increased um, as the um, as various policy changes have, have come in, not least of which have been uh, things like the, the carbon floor price um, as as forced a change in the economics of Longana. And we always expected that. You know, our plan was always to get Longana to twenty twenty. Um, and at the same time, uh, obviously, with Scottish Power, invest heavily in renewables, given, um, given um, you know, onshore, offshore wind in terms of that investment. So we always expected Longanet to be phased out of the network. But what we're seeing in terms of the short term is a real pressure on the economics of the plant. And it's a, it's a combination of, of a, a number of factors, the environmental uh, changes that are occurring due to the, some of the European environmental legislation kicking in, in in April 16, the carbon floor price at £18 um, hitting the plant in terms of all its output and a, an expectation will pay £170 million this year in, in, in carbon taxation. Uh, and then on top of that, I suppose, I suppose what we could say is all coal plant, England, Wales, Scotland face all those pressures. Long and it's no different from any coal plant. The difference Longanet has is it's based in Scotland, which has higher transmission charges. So, you know, whereas a, a, a plant in, in the south of England will pay maybe zero transmission or, or actually get paid for transmission, we pay uh, 40, 50 million a year in transition. And it's all these factors together that have brought a pressure onto the economics of Longanet, which has brought April 16 into a real focus. Yeah, just, just to pursue further a couple of points. I mean, the transmission charging regime that affects Longanet is something we're, we're well aware of as a committee. But there's nothing new about that. That's been in existence for how, how many years? It's been in existence for... for well, it's, it's, it's changing just now in terms of some of the recent things, but the principle of it's been in existence for a decade. And, and Scottish Power sort of talked about it for a decade as well in terms of the points, but it's, it's the transmission plus the other factors that are leading to the, the pressure on the economics. Right, so it's not, it's not simply transmission, although that is a factor. It's not simply that is, is driving the current decision. No, no, not, not at all. It's the okay. combination of things. I suppose the, okay. the key thing, that the key point that transmission comes out is that that's the difference okay. between Longana and the other coal plant. All coal plants face the same pressures with carbon taxation, environment, European environmental legislation. You know, Longana just is the only one that faces the heavy transmission charges because it's located in Scotland. Th th thank you for that clarity. Can I just ask you then, where exactly are we now? Because there's been speculation in the press that you've been in discussion with National Grid. Um, these discussions, according to some reports, have broken down. According to other reports, are still ongoing. What exactly is the position as of today? 
Well, we've been we've been speaking with National Grid for a, around eighteen months, and really in in detailed discussion since September. Um, National Grid at the moment are running a uh, a constraint management requirement, uh, basically a a proposal process where um, plant that can deliver the services are, are bidding in. Uh, to National Grid to provide those services from April 2016 until October 2017. And we're in the middle of that process at the moment. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll come to Mike Calvary in a moment as well as to get his perspective on all this. But, I mean, some of the speculation in the press has suggested that, you know, if there's no satisfactory outcome, as, from your point of view, to, to these discussions with National Grid, you're going to bring forward the closure of Loganet. What can you tell us about what exactly is currently being um, thought around that issue? Well, uh, we've been pretty pretty consistent since really the October when we didn't enter the the capacity mechanism. That if if um, something doesn't change at Longana, then the the likelihood of closure is very high, and that that closure will be, um, you know, we, the, the way the system works, we basically have to announce about a year in advance of closure that we're giving up the transmission rights, which is the signal for uh, closure. Um, so effectively, that decision is now for the April 2016 time period. And we've made that you know, very clear in, in, in October in terms of when we came out to that. And obviously, we've made it very clear in the, in the, in the tender documents to National Grid. So if you can't reach agreement with National Grid about this, 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 this mechanism, what is what is going to happen to Long Island? Um Well, in terms of the, um, you know, what I'll perhaps read out what we said in our letter because that's probably the, the 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 most clear. You know, it, it's important to note that in the event of rejection of our offers, we'll be forced to announce as soon as is practical the closure of Long Island Power Station by the end of March 2016. Uh, we believe that the closure will have serious consequences on security of supply and on direct and indirect employment in the local community and beyond. Okay. Th thank you for that. Um, I um, represent Fife, my, my, my colleague Cara Hilton, who's here as the constituency member for uh, Dunfermline, and, and you know we represent the area. We're obviously got a very real concern for the workers at Longanet, who must be very concerned about uh, these discussions about about their future employment and the wider knock-on impact on the, the Fife economy. I hope you can reassure me if I've got this wrong, but you know, is there an element of brinkmanship here? You're in discussion with National Grid. Are you seeking to up the ante by putting some of this in the public domain? We've seen the, the Energy Minister making comment. We've seen the Scottish First Minister making comment. We as a committee are looking at this. Are you using the workers at Long Annette as pawns in a game just to try and force National Grid to come to the negotiating table? No, not at all, not at all. We, if you, you, know, if you visit Long Annette, what you'll see around Long Garnet or are statements like securing the future to 2020. You'll see pictures of staff saying, you know, having that, saying that, having that as a logo. Our plan uh, was always to get to 2020 and keep this plant, keep this plant going. Um, we've invested in the belief of, of getting to that point. You know, we've invested £350 million pounds in the plant over the last six or seven years. You know, it's a it's a big old plant. It takes £30 million a year to, to keep it going in terms of capital investment. And we've continued to commit to that 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 investment. So it's it's not brinkmanship at all. It's just a an economic reality of the situation we find ourselves in with regard to Longana. Um, we continue to invest in Scotland, you know, um, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 billion a year. We continue to invest across the UK. We continue to build our networks. We continue to build renewable plants. We continue to do all that within Scottish Power. Um, it's just that this plant that has existed for 42 years is on the, is on a uh, is in a very very difficult situation economically. Thank you. I can maybe then turn to Mr. Calvi from from National Grid. I mean, you've you've had the position set out. By Scottish Power, essentially what they're saying is they might have to close the plant by uh, March 2016. That means a lot of jobs are going to go uh, uh, in five. It's going to be a big uh, gap in Scottish electricity generation capacity. They're putting the ball back in your court and saying, why are you, National Grid, uh, not uh, prepared to do a deal with them? Yeah. 
So, thank you for inviting me this morning. Um, it's probably just worth saying we as system operator, you know, we're responsible for the real-time balancing of the Great Britain electricity network um, and for directing and coordinating flows across that network. And we operate the, the, the system to agreed security standards and we take that role very seriously. And we believe we are a prudent operator that will always consider risks to, so that we maintain the extremely high levels of reliability that the system enjoys. Um, we also have to recognise we are in the middle of a, of a big energy transition as we move to a low-carbon economy. So, you know, I absolutely understand the concerns around the potential closure along Gannett and the timing of that. But, you know, we have seen over 10 gigawatts of generation, fossil fuel generation, across the GB system close in the last five years. And there's probably another five gigawatts due to close in the, in the coming few years. So, you know, there is a lot of fossil fuel generation in similar situations. So, for example, Barking Combined Cycle Gas Power Station in London closed last year, six months ago. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of setting this context that, you know, as, as, as Neil said, there are common pressures on a lot of generators. Um, clearly, the issue with, with potential closure of Long Gannett that's been raised is it does pay a uh, important role in terms of Scotland and therefore because of the potential closure of Long Gannett and some uncertainty about Peterhead Power Station as well, we've been doing studies jointly with the Scottish transmission companies over the past 12 months looking at how we secure the network in a scenario where both Long Gannett and Peterhead weren't available. Um, and ultimately where we uh, concluded on that was at least until some transmission reinforcements are delivered, including the Western Link project, which I think you'll be aware of, um, we felt that particularly in order to uh, ensure we can have stable voltage control in some sort of uh, you know risky but uh, um, not com you know, inconceivable circumstances, that we wanted to procure some additional balancing services for 2016-17. We are in the middle of a tender process for that, as Neil said. Uh, we are looking for offers and we will, as we're obliged to by licence, um, um, procure the most economic um, option that's in the best interest of consumers. Um, that process we're expecting to finish certainly by the end of March and hopefully in the next week or so. So um, I can't say what the outcome will be yet, but we will ultimately choose what we think is the best option in terms of the most efficient for the system. Um, we clearly, you know, can't comment about individual power stations and their decisions. That is a that is a decision for power station operators. So, just to clarify, we we, we will know your decision by, what do you say, within by the end of this month. By the end of this month, yeah. Right, and that just to put it back to Scottish Power, I mean, you'll be in a position to know by the end of this month whether or not Long Island has a future. No, that's correct. Okay. Okay, okay, I'm going to bring in Lewis MacDonald the supplementary and then Bruce Crawford. Yeah. I wanted, first of all, to understand just what it is these talks uh, are concerned with. I think we've got a little bit of a, an insight from what you have said, but uh, clearly Scottish Power is not asking National Grid to change the national system um, overnight. Presumably the conversation is around, as you say, a bid. I'm interested to know, um, and, and I don't... I, I recognise my you said he, he cannot comment on individual power stations, but clearly SSE are here, and um, I can only assume that we're talking about uh, a bid that involves the two companies and the two power stations which uh, currently exist. Um, I'd therefore like to understand um, from National Grid, but also from the generators, what the consequences are of the decisions that will be made in this additional balancing requirement. There is existing power from both stations on the grid at the moment. Um, what, is, it, is it the case that the additional balancing requirement is essential to the economic feasibility of both stations? Um, and if not, what's the difference? So, what we have identified is that for a scenario in 2016-17 where there may be low or no availability from uh, Long Gannett and Peterhead that we would need at least one balancing mechanism unit, so a four or 500 megawatt generating unit available to provide voltage control services. So effectively, that is what we are uh, asking people to provide. Um, as you said, it is sort of interesting because we are bidding for a requirement that might actually be provided naturally by the market already, but given the statements you've already heard, you can understand why we think it's prudent to 
go and procure. And if you talk to the SSC, there were some sort of uh, uncertainties and permutations about exactly what's going to happen to Peterhead and how that relates to their, their um, carbon capture and storage project. So we felt it was prudent. There is actually a third party also in talks about a innovative um, new provider of services. Um, so we are considering three three options and we are assessing them against a number of technical and economic factors and we'll come to our decision, as I said, as soon as possible, but recognising the timescales for decisions we have undertaken to do that by the end of March and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to conclude the process in the next week or so. Yeah, um, yeah I can, well, I can confirm to, to the member that SSE is participating in the process for Peterhead, as, as people would expect. Uh, in terms of the what does it mean for Peterhead, whether it wins or, or, or not a contract, uh, there are a number of permutations for Peterhead in the future. I mean, t people uh, should understand that at the moment, uh, Peterhead is effectively commercially out, out of the market. Uh, we reduced the tech of the station down to 400 megawatts back in April, to reduce costs, uh, we could, just to sort of reinforce what, what Neil has said, really all thermal plant in, in the GV system is uh, challenged economically at the moment. Uh, so that was that was purely a cost saving. Now we're investing £15 million this year, which will allow us to actually operate below 400 megawatts, which we can't do at the moment, uh, and that will be available for the winter. Um, the other factor to, uh, is obviously carbon capture and storage. We've been working with Shell now for over two years uh, in that project. Uh, the engineering studies are, are coming to a close, um, and uh, it's, it will now go back, and, and obviously DEC are now looking to get state aid clearance uh, from Europe uh, for the project. And if the project follows the timetable that's planned, then a financial investment decision on that project would probably take place around a year from now. Uh, and clearly that would secure uh, one unit at Peterhead for the next 15 years beyond that. Um, so uh, we, as I say, the plant uh, is currently out of the market because it's uneconomic. Uh, we've had to, to uh, reduce tech. Uh, we've, in the past, we've uh, bid Peter head in to provide services to National Grid. Uh, over the summer, we had a voltage contract. Uh, this winter pass, we bid for a SBR, a strategic uh, balancing reserve contract, uh, where it was there to support the grid if needed. Uh, and indeed, National Grid have an option to extend that contract to next winter if they so wish. So there, you know, there are a number of potential out outcomes for Peter Head. Uh, and of course, overlaid on top of that is the economics of thermal generation. I mean, at, at one point is that Peter Ed, although it participated in the capacity market auction for 2018, it didn't actually receive a contract uh, because the price we were looking for was higher than the price that it cleared that. Uh, and that's the, that's the truth for about eight gigawatts of thermal plant in the GV system. And all of that plant uh, will face a decision uh, for the plant that still has tech about whether to give it up, as, as Neil says, you've got to give a year's notice. That process is a, a bit later this year because of uh, the JR and tr Project Transmit. Um, but some plant will probably make the decision not, not to, but I, I, mean, I can't comment what others will do, but we only just need to wait and see. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to understand from Scottish Power, because what, we've, what, we're, what I think we understand is that we're talking about an additional requirement from National Grid, which you are bidding for, yeah. presumably, um, or, or is what you're saying that you were uneconomic already, and that without this additional contract you cannot proceed. That, that that's basically correct. You know, a coal power station has a, a lot of big fixed costs. You know, we obviously operate gas plant as well, and and it's a, a much more. Uh, you can you can manage the cost down in a much easier manner, you know, in terms of the variable cost level. But a coal plant has a lot of costs. You know, we have to spend twenty, thirty million a year in capital. We have to spend fifty million a year in operating costs. So you obviously need to recover that amount of expenditure, and and this is obviously we're bidding into this tender to try and effectively get extra revenue to cover some of those costs. What's been asked for in the tender is 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 350 megawatts of of voltage support, and and maybe just to explain um, to the committee for a moment, 
and then it might might be better doing it this, but there's there's two I suppose there's two sides to a managing a grid. There's the managing the the demand and supply side, the quantity, and then there's the managing of the quality. Is the voltage correct so everybody can use all their electrical appliances? Is the frequency correct? So this contract effectively is asking for 350 megawatts to support the quality of, of electricity on the network. Um, and, and therefore, obviously, Longana at the moment is, is, is 2,260 megawatts. So, you know, there, there's got to be change at the plant even if we win the contract. But that's what we've, that's what we've planned for in terms of, in terms of our, bid, our bid international grid. Significant reduction in... It, it, it would, yes, yeah, yeah. In that context, and, and, and final to that point, would that therefore have employment implications, even if you were successful? Well, it's the, it's, it's the difference between, you know, there's 270 people work at Long Gannett, and, and with a, and obviously that's the direct employees for Scottish Power, there's a lot more when it comes to our suppliers. Um the plant closing in its entirety has the major impact. The, the plant staying open with two, three units, whatever, then it's much easier to manage that through the usual, you know, early retirement type schemes and, 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 and voluntary type schemes. And that's, you know, that's what we do. And that's what Scottish Power's always done. You know, we've, we've, we've always managed, you know, we, some of those people will, will want to stay at Scottish Power, work in our networks, business, work, whatever, and we'll, we'll manage it like we've always done. Perfect. Thank you, Vina. I've had the opportunity to be at Langanet a couple of times, so I know it reasonably well. So, but thank you for being here to give us evidence today. Um, but given the potential timescale issues and closure for Langanet, obviously the importance of longer term resilience and security is something inevitably the committee are interested in. So, can I begin just with a strategic high level question so I can get some clarity in my understanding here? And I'm not sure whether this is to Mike or, or Martin. Um, but which organisation in the architecture of transmission and generation of power of, uh, for electricity in the UK has formal responsibility for security of supply? So there's, there's a number of aspects of security of supply, so I'm, I'll try to give you as clear an answer as I can. So the overall responsible to security of supply sits with the Secretary of State um, of the British Government for the overall system. And it's very clear. And so, for example, we've seen with electricity market reform and the capacity mechanism, the, the government has, British government has implemented um, the capacity mechanism in order to ensure there is uh, sufficient overall generation capacity to meet demand across, across the GB system. National Grid and System Operator, though, we are responsible for the real-time operation and effectively balancing the network, and we work to um, some defined security, quality, and uh, um, system security quality standards, SQSS. Um, so we effectively, within, within that overall framework, are obliged to make sure that the system will balance and the system can be operated and the quality aspects that Neil was talking about so that we can manage the volts and manage the frequency um, can, can, can be done, which is why, therefore, if we see an issue on a, on a local or regional level where maybe the overall system has enough generation, but there might be some concern that in certain conditions there's not enough generation available in a certain locality, we will then take action such as contracting in the short term and probably in the medium to long term um, uh, prompting the investment in further transmission assets to, to make sure the system is robust and secure. So effectively, the, oh, sorry about if I just add to that, I, I agree with what Mike has said, um, but it, in essence we, we rely on generators responding to signals um, in the main market signals um, in delivering security of supply, um, so that there's a really important role of the market in, in this. Our role as Ofgem is, is both to um, look at the, the market rules and make sure they're appropriate so that generators are responding to those um, signals. and. Um, on occasions when we, often working collectively with DEC and with National Grid, um, consider there are issues, as has happened in, in the recent past, we will look to provide additional tools um, to National Grid to enable them to, to deliver security of supply, um, including the, the supplementary balancing response um, that was, was mentioned earlier. So there are examples of this working in practice. Just to be clear, though, it's DEC who have the responsibility for security of supply, and that doesn't lie either with National Grid or Ofgen. 
It's, in some senses, it's a combination, though, because DECA are overall responsible for the policy. Yeah, but who has statutory responsibility for security of supply? That's the question I just need absolute clarity on. The, pol the policy responsibility is with DEC. Mm -hmm. The day-to-day -day operation of the system is with no. National Grid. Okay, okay, fine. But we could, could come to black start issues, because obviously, if Longanit's no longer there, it begins to raise questions of that. My understanding is that crew can... In a, sorry, a black start situation is when all the everything goes down. Not impossible, unlikely, but not impossible. But everything goes down, we get into black start, crew can is the first thing that works because it's pump storage. It then gives the power to Longanit, and Longanit in turn then powers all the other power stations because they need enormous amounts of power to operate in their own right. What happens when Longanit's no longer there? Um, black Star, as you said, is something that we plan for, even though we hope we never have to do it. Um, it is the ultimate insurance policy. Um, we effectively have a uh, portfolio of stations that we contract to provide Black Start services across the network. Um, and we did a big exercise about five years ago for the um, uh, UK Government um, Energy um, Emergency Executive Committee, E3C, looking at Black Start policy and basically agreed a, uh, an approach where we would make sure we have at least three Black Start stations available in each region of the country. And for this purpose, Scotland is a region. Actually, in Scotland at the moment, we have four contracted Black Start stations, including Kraken, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and for the avoidance of doubt, neither Longana or Peterhead are contracted Black Start stations. As you say, though, our Black Start plans, as, as you conceive doing a Black Start and conceive the worst case where you've lost the entire GB network, you have to vet the piece of network back um, together bit by bit, and having large, flexible, or reasonably flexible plants such as Longanit available <coughs> does help you. So the answer to your question is, if we don't have Longanit, we would have to uh, develop alternative strategies. We actually um, have a number, you know, it's quite hard to sort of predict how, that is how a black start would work in practice. We have a number of different strategies we would apply, um, and inevitably, um, you know, we would, you know, if, if, if we have one of Longana and Peterhead, we think we can probably black start um, Scotland uh, within an overall GB black start in similar timescales to we can at the moment, which is a sort of um, 12 to 24 hour timescale. Um, if neither uh, Peterhead or Longana is available to help with black start, it probably would extend the timescales because we may only be able to do certain amounts in Scotland in terms of developing a skeletal network and then have to sort of rely on uh, the wider GB network all coming up together. So um, it is something we are considering. We will be updating our Black Start restoration plans as the evolving generation uh, uh, pattern develops. Um, but it is probably worth saying that this is, uh, you know, different parts of the network have different amounts of generation connected. The parts that have more generation connected inevitably will probably come back quicker in a Black Start um, you know, the last thing I probably should say is, you know, this is a definite worst, worst case. We, we, you know, we've never seen a full system black start where we have seen, you know, the last major black start event was the 1987 hurricane. And even that was just part of the system. So, you know, and, and in, a, in a scenario where having to do a black start for just part of the system, because you can effectively build off what's already there, you can do it much quicker anyway. So we really are considering the worst, worst case, which is a full system shutdown. This is our insurance policy that was I think, quite yep. rightly described it that way. And we've just heard from Neil that potentially um, Longanit might not be there after March 2016 if this contract arrangement thing doesn't work out. Can I ask Jim Smith then on these circumstances, if Longanit's not there and Peterhead's our fallback, has Peterhead got the capacity, once Kruikin's given its power, to start up the rest of Scotland? Well, I think... Uh as uh, Mike said, there's other stations beside Kruikin as well, with Foyers, uh, Pump Storage Scheme, and also Sloy provide Black Start yeah. facilities. But if I right understand this, it needs that huge generating capacity of one of the, the, the stations immediately after Kruikin and Foyer to start up to put it into the next station to give it their boost to, the, to help the nukes get back up, for instance. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, um, Mike is the expert in the in network Black Start, but uh, yeah, I think he's right. He needs an airshow in the system with a large generator to allow him to start up quickly. But if he doesn't, then he would need to rely on interconnectors from other regions of the country. OK, in that case, is the interconnector from the U rest of the UK strong enough to provide the level of power required to, in a start-up situation, a Black Start? Yes. 
the 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 debate on black start is is you know is is um is is a time scale issue we we can always bring the system back but we absolutely recognize in this you know what would be a, or clearly a, a an awful situation bring it back as quickly as possible would be you know would 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 be what we'd be aiming to do and we absolutely can black start scotland with effectively nothing in no scottish generation by using the interconnectors to the rest of you know the, the the circuits linking it to the rest of the network, it would just take longer. So that's the the issue with Black Start is purely a in this extreme scenario, how quickly can you get it back? And we recognise that if uh, both Longanet and Peterhead aren't available, a Black Start will probably take longer in Scotland. Right. I think I think historically uh, and and. It's important to realise that the transmission network in the UK was effectively an England and Wales network, a central belt of Scotland network, and a north of Scotland network. And therefore, the Blackstock plans related to each of those transmission networks. So SSE had their plan in terms of foyers, and the and the central belt of Scotland was effectively Cruiken came on, water came down the hill. There's a line that goes direct from the transmission line that goes from Kruikan to Longana. Longana comes up and that then repowers the network. Um, so interconnection within Black Start is 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 quite a quite a new thing in, in terms of in terms of the the model. Um, but that that's been the effectively the plan for forty years. You know, it's never been used, thankfully. It got tested. Actually, we had um, in in November this year we had Kruikan totally without power for the first time. I think for twenty years, where we took it totally down and National Grid tested that, and we did a full test of Kruikan to Longana. I think five years ago, as Mike said, as part of the overall UK plan. Um, but that's been the that's been the route. So we effectively get a a, a payment a year providing Black Start services at Kruikan. Longana's just been there. I think part of our connection agreement for Longana in- includes the provision of some of those services, albeit the contract for Black Star is directly with Kruikun. And that, that's how it's worked for, for many, many years. The, the final question is time scales, because if, obviously if Longana's there, it can be done relatively quicker than if Longana's no longer there. What do we mean by taking longer to get, it, to get restarted if Longana's no longer in the system? So when we did the E3C study, we effectively looked at the sort of distribution of how quickly to get 60% of GB demand back. And in the best case, it's about 12 to 13 hours. And in what we call a challenging case where things don't go as well as we might hope, it might take um, anything up to 36 hours. Looking at Scotland by itself, we probably think that we can do Scotland in 12 to 18 hours with the current Black Start stations and with Longan and Peterhead available. If neither of them are available, it probably pushes Scotland by itself to a sort of 24 hours plus. So it's still within the envelope of the overall GB um, plans, but it is clearly uh, likely to take longer than it would if those stations were available. And that is just because, as Neil says, um, you know, you do benefit from having a large plant um, available in terms of how how it would actually work in practice. Okay, and finally, just a final question. I think Jim Smith will. No, I was just going to answer, I think, Mr. Crover's question that he'd asked me earlier on properly that Peter Ed can provide that role if Long Annette wasn't providing the role of Black Star to support the Black Star process. That's helpful. Finally, just on the stability, the resilience issue, uh, voltage stability. If if Long Annette's no longer there, because I understand not only at peak winter demand at 40%, but it's called on significantly in the summer for the purposes of voltage stability. How do we ensure voltage stability in the Scottish network if Long Gannett's no longer there? Yeah, well, voltage control, voltage stability is the reason why we are con- going through the current procurement exercise to buy services. So for sixteen seventeen, we absolutely recognise that we do need... Um, uh, someone to provide uh, additional services in order to manage it's 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 a lowish risk but we felt it was prudent action um in the longer term um there are investments in the transmission system being taken forward which will help um particularly uh we've worked with the scottish uh, transmission owners uh, scottish power transmission and uh, she transmission 
um, to identify a number of uh, uh, reactive compensation investments, and they are due to come on stream by 2017. Um, National Grid itself will be doing some uh, in similar investments in the north of England, which will also help. Um, Western Link will also, by itself, doesn't help with voltage control, but some of the um, uh, uh, control equipment at um, Hunterston will actually also provide a voltage control benefit. So there's a number of transmission investments which are in the pipeline, which effectively we have um, commissioned, uh, sort of, as in uh, ordered, in order to deal with the scenario where uh, Long Gannett and Peter Head aren't available. Yeah, but of course, what, you're, what they're buying is the additional. So apologies. I'll, I'll, I'll come back in if I get another chance. But. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crawford. Um, okay, Gordon McDonald. Uh, just to continue this before I ask my own questions, um, I'm keen to understand if we're in a situation where Long Gannett and Peterhead aren't available, and I think, Mike, you said we need to depend on the rest of the UK, but the rest of the UK is a net importer of electricity from Scotland, Wales, France, and Northern Ireland. The interconnectors from France and the net, sorry, Netherlands, I should say, not Northern Ireland. The interconnector from France and the Netherlands appears to be working at capacity 24 hours a day. So how much spare capacity does the UK network actually have to meet these situations where, say, Long Gannett and Peterhead aren't available? Yeah. Um, it's a very good question. Um, I think when you look at these things, you have to recognise that um, we're moving to a world where, you know, traditionally there's been a pretty consistent large export from Scotland into the rest of the GB network to now that Scotland has so much uh, intermittent wind generation on it that there will still be probably for the majority of the time a large export from Scotland to the rest of the network. It was record levels in 2013, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and more, you know, more, more wind generation is connecting continually in Scotland. So, you know, the, 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 this will increase. Um, but there will be periods, clearly, when the wind's not blowing in Scotland, that we'll increasingly start to see flows from um, England up into Scotland. And, you know, and that sort of dynamic is probably, you know, I operate an entire GB system and we're used to that sort of dynamic. So, you know, the power flows where it will. And the fact that sometimes it flows one way and sometimes flows the other way, that's, you know, pretty, you know, typical for... The relationship is that the interconnector, 90% of the time the electricity flows south, 10% of the time the electricity flows north. Would that be That's right? probably about right at the moment, yeah. but I think going forward, that will change and we'll see the amount of time it flowing north will increase, albeit I still think you're right, it will still probably flow south the majority of the time. So I think the question you're asking is, when the power needs to flow north, will there be enough? Yeah. Ultimately, that is a question, there will, almost by definition, there will be enough as long as overall GB has sufficient generation to meet its overall security standards. Um, that is what EMR, the capacity mechanism, is designed to do, to ensure that GB as a whole has sufficient generation capacity. Um, and in the short term, until EMR comes on stream in 2018, um, we have um, these new uh, tools that Martin talked about, um, supplemental balancing reserve that we used last winter, um, where we procured some additional generation across GB, including Peterhead, as um, uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, and we are currently actually out for tender looking at whether we need to buy anything more for this winter. So we, you know, we are reasonably confident that across GB there should be an overall enough generation to meet demand, even at periods where the wind's not blowing. Uh, and therefore, if there's enough across GB, then there, you know, there will be enough uh, you know, to, in order to attend to Scotland if, 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 if it's needed, as long as there's sufficient transmission capacity. And that's effectively what our analysis work has looked at. You said the word should a few times there. Well. Um, there's four, there's, what would be the, the spare capacity? Would I be right in saying it's as low as 4%? Um, the, currently, the, for last winter, it was actually 6%. And just to be clear what I'm talking about, where, the way we define spare capacity is we look at something we call the derated margin. So we look at all the generation on the system. We apply a derating factor that takes into account typical availability at peak. So 
coal and gas, we'd particularly look at sort of 85 to 90% availability. Wind, we've done all the statistical analysis, you know, and we recognise actually getting no wind anywhere in the, in, the, in the network is very unlikely. So we, we've worked it out and it's typically a factor of about 15 or 20% we allow for, for wind. And so we do all of that, we derate everything, and then we quote the difference between the derated generation availability and the, and, and the forecast peak demand. That's a, the, the, the 4% number you, you saw talked about with actually once we did our SBR actions uh, was 6% for um, last winter. So as it happened, last winter hasn't been particularly cold. Um, underlying demands are probably quite being actually quite slightly lower than expected so we didn't actually use any of our um, um, SBR contracts that we use so even though there was probably quite a bit of concern going into winter about how tight the margin was I would have said that you know the winter was reasonably comfortable though we are, we are never complacent about um, security. So m yeah. moving on to my own questions uh, I want to ask about just to fully understand the situation about generating capacity what is the current generating capacity in Scotland and what is the peak demand in Scotland? Current generation capacity is about 11 gigawatts and the peak demand is 5.4 gigawatts. And how much um, generation capacity is currently contracted to connect in Scotland over the next few years? Um, I believe um, we have 14 gigawatts that's got transmission contracts. So, you know... Given that we could lose Longana and Peterhead and, and accepting the Black Star argument that we heard from the generators, and yeah. th does that give Scotland enough headroom to meet its peak demand? I think generally, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think the, the condition we've been focusing on is because a lot of that, um, certainly the new generation coming on, is, is wind. Therefore, the concern is, yeah, yeah, that's fine most of the time. What about when the wind's not blowing? And it has to be the wind not blowing across the whole of Scotland, which, you know, is, is, is I think, possible, but, you know, clearly pretty unlikely. So that's why I probably regard the work we've been doing as reasonably prudent. We've been analysing what happens if there's no wind and there's no peatead and there's no long anit. So I think, you know, what we're saying is in the short term, we need one one additional unit um, once we've made the transmission investments uh, that we've uh, discussed and agreed with the uh, Scottish transmission companies um, then I think you know there there should be enough uh, generation in Scotland to meet peak demand uh, uh, allowing for the capability of the transmission system. And mo moving on to Longana itself um, is there an alternative uh, method that Longana could be used to um, say use wood pellets for instance and what effect, if, if that transfer was able to take place, would that have on your operating costs? Um, well, we, we did some um, biomass trials about six, seven years ago. And, and um, there's this, this two, I suppose there's always you know, those two key things that we found in that. The first was just the 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 technical combustion impact of the of the pellets into a forty year old station was it was quite volatile. You know, it was it was difficult to manage the actual combustion. There was technical problems, and obviously, there's where to get all the wood pellets from. You know, it's a big station; it, it's five million tons of coal a year, and all those trains going in. And and where do you, where do you get the wood pellets from to burn it? And that, that you know that was a, a major sort of supply chain problem that we had with with biomass so we have done trials in the past but it's just it's just not a you know the, the plant as I, as I said earlier the, the, you know the plant is 40 years old so it takes a lot of investment to com convert anything you know we spent 200 million 250 million reducing the sulfur output from from the plant and that was a combination of the new technology you know bolting onto a very old plant um so economically the, the biomass never never really sort of worked for for Longana. so mo moving on to the point that scottish power's been making about transmission charges um last week you had a press release that says there needs to be a fair and level playing field with the rest of the uk in order to develop new power generation in scotland no other country in europe has this unfair locational based charging system for power stations and we need a fairer system for Scotland. So, so what is the what is your understanding of the charging regime elsewhere in Europe, and why are we currently got this um, 
charging system that seems to favour the south of the, the UK? Uh, the, the UK system is a, is a locational-based system, which effectively, um, if you've got... Um, it effectively looks where the demand is in the country, where the demand's high, and charges plants less if they're close to that demand and more if they're a distance from that demand. In a U no, or would that demand be Edinburgh? It's in a UK Glasgow context. So it basically... Imagine a graph across the UK who's consuming the most, then the yeah. southeast consumes the most, and it, it differs. So there's no, there's no sort of local aspect to any, any of that transmission charge. In, in other places in Europe, in, in, in Germany, in Belgium, in Netherlands, they, they operate a, a, a flat transmission charge, more of a, I suppose, what you call a postage stamp transmission, where... Uh, no different from you know sending a letter from the north of Scotland to London is the same as sending a letter within London. Then the the transmission charge is, is the same across the the country. Now there's obvious benefits to that in the in that plant can locate anywhere in that country, and there's an offset to that in so much as you know the transmission operator you know can't be building lines to the middle of nowhere and 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 bringing them into demand and spending a lot on that transmission network but but countries have made different decisions on that in in the past um and it's actually coming into focus more in the UK now with the increase in interconnection because effectively the plants in the UK that maybe have Different regimes, whether it be transmission, whether it be carbon floor price, differ from the plants in Europe that are generating to interconnect across the UK where they maybe don't have those transmission charges, maybe where they don't have the carbon floor price um, impact. And, and so there's, a, there's a, a lot of thinking in the industry about that problem because everyone wants more interconnection. It's the best way of, frankly, managing... Um, energy generation across Europe is to, to have us moving energy to the places where it's needed. But it's important that the generation plants across Europe operate on a level playing field with each other in a competitive sense. Um, and th and that's, the, you know, that's a debate that's going on in the background all the time in, in, in the UK just now is how to level up that playing field. Just from our perspective, to give some um, context around transmission charges, you know, National Grid set the transmission charges and we approved the methodology, so we're, we're very closely involved in that. Um, back in 2010, we started a major review of how transmission charges work, looked at the pros and cons of, of different systems, um, and what we found through that was that the, uh, there is clear value to consumers throughout GB, Scottish consumers, English and Welsh consumers, from having a system where um, generators and consumers aren't necessarily charged on just where they're located, but are charged based on a, um, an estimate of the costs that they impose on the transmission system. So they're paying the costs that they um, lead to. It's a, intended to be very reflective of the costs of the system. That's what we would see as a, as a fair system. Um, the, the system we have um, proposed coming out of that review, which we decided on last summer, um, will reduce the costs to most of the generators based in Scotland compared to what we have in the past, so the only change that's occurring really around that is a, a reduction in charges compared to what they've been in the past. Clearly, it's still true that um, generators in Scotland pay more than generators in England, just as consumers in Scotland for transmission pay less than consumers in England. For, for transmission, yes, overall. Not overall for if you include other network charges, which are calculated on a different basis. That's absolutely fair. It's also not... It's true that the exact system we have doesn't exist elsewhere in Europe. It's certainly not true to say that um, other locational charging systems don't exist in Europe. I think that's um, misleading. <coughs> the, the CMA, who we've refer referred the whole energy market to, have been looking at this recently there. Um, one of their reports says the main Australian market, the Nordic market, markets in the most of the northeast USA, Texas and California are all examples of markets that have adopted either zonal or nodal, i.e. locational approaches um, to wholesale markets and we've chosen to do it through transmission charges but all these other markets also the Italian market has 
um, locational charges. So there's, there's plenty of other markets. Most of the markets that have seriously reviewed their electricity market design have um, elements of locational charging where generators or customers based in different parts of the country will um, face different revenues or, or different charges. We've chosen to do it in a slightly different way through transmission charges. You can argue about the pros and cons of different systems, but our review over the last few years has found that some form of locational charging is definitely in the interest of consumers overall. Um, you know, some generators will clearly find it's not in their particular interests, um, but, but our focus really is what's in the best interest of consumers. We'll need to move on. I appreciate these are complex issues, but I'm also conscious of the time, and, and I've still got a long list of members uh, to, to come in. So if we can try and keep questions and, and responses as, as, as sharp as possible, that would be helpful. Check ready. Good morning. Uh, I was kind of surprised. First of all, we seem to have an, an endemic in here that nobody has any responsibility for the security of supply, statutory. Um, so... Yeah, that might be for another day. But, um, Martin, I want to, off gem, uh, we have a quote here, says, it's very difficult to accurately estimate the level of security of supply that will be provided by the market. Now, market creates demand. And we're talking about the supply. And last year, we met Ashley, I think Julian from National Grid, who suggested there was a 4% capacity. You've updated that to 6%. But totally unable to tell us what, what, what the plans were in terms of the capacity guarantee that we'd have for the coming winter. Why is that? Um, so th the government has set out a security standard that it expects um, to be met, which is three hours loss of load expectation. Um, that's clear and that's now set out um, from DEC very, very clearly. Um, we have, over the last few years, and, and National Grid has as well, been providing forward-looking estimates of the, the margins going forward. We've always felt that this winter just gone and the, and the winter coming up are going to be the, the areas that we were most concerned about. Um, so looking forward to that, it, it is difficult to know which individual generators are going to close and which are going to um, open. The generators are quite cagey about announcing this well in advance, as you've sort of seen. By, I think... Julian, I'm not, I'm not sure, I can't remember which of the two it was, that uh, in the event of going through your calculations, which uh, are very interesting, that they would have to go and negotiate through the SPR the opening of plants down south. Why? So the SPR mechanism is intended to um, uh, deal with the uncertainty that we face looking forwards and provide a mechanism for National Grid to contract with existing providers of generation predominantly. So what's the capacity for this coming winter? <clears throat> at, the moment, at the moment, when we're looking ahead, it looks to be broadly similar to the winter just gone. However, we are conscious that there are a number of generators that didn't get um, contracts under EMR in the capacity mechanism 2018, that therefore <coughs> there might be some question about their future and when they might close. Now, we would hope maybe that there, you know, people have maybe, you know, and, and, and I've certainly had some indications. I think Centrica announced that they will be closing um, two of their plant and with, a, with almost immediate effect. Um, so I think, yeah, as, as Martin says, the key issue is we don't, you know, it is a market. We don't know what individual power station operators are going to do. And 70 people on the streets, potentially, because you don't know what you think the maximum or minimum demand no will be next winter? We know what the demand will be. There is uncertainty about the supply. Once that uncertainty is resolved, we will complete our tenders for SBR, which will address any concerns about the overall national plant margin. And uh, the existing process we have going on, I think, will address any, any, any additional balancing services we need for voltage control or other system services. So... Uh, you know, the, the, the only uncertainty is an uncertainty about what generators are going to do once that uncertainty resolves and we will very clearly decide what action we need to take and we have the tools that we need to, 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 to take the action to secure the network. Okay. We heard, we heard about interconnectivity, interconnectors. What's the situation with the Northern Ireland connector? Is it working? And how often, if it is, how often has it been out of action this year? 
Um, I don't have the precise uh, figures for how often it's been out of action, but it is broadly working. And uh, I think it had a period a, a few years ago where it had had quite a few technical problems, but it's broadly working and uh, uh, is used reg regularly. It's it's broadly working. What is, what, is broad, what is broadly working mean? It's running at a lower capacity than its full design capacity due to the, the technical issues, but it's it's been operating at that at that capacity for a period. I think the. Um, you know the plans to to bring it back up to full capacity are a matter for the operator of of the link, um, but it's, it's something I think they're looking at. So yeah, somebody else's problem. No, no, well, it's 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 a matter for the operator of the link as to how they run that link. That's their business, um, but it's been operating I think at two fifty megawatts um, for the for the past period um, of time. Generally, it's been exporting to Northern Ireland, so it's. Um, not all of the time it's been flowing in both directions but it's um i think that the planning assumptions when you look at security supplies are that often it would be exporting rather than importing it's not necessarily helping provide more electricity to scotland okay one last question i'll make sure. we're talking about i think 40 million pounds a year is, is it was in terms of the connection hey, martin national grid made 3.7 billion pounds operating profit last year it also invested very heavily in your operations in the States. Has Long Annet just fallen down the whole priority list as far as National Grid is concerned? Ultimately, decisions around power stations uh, and when you know what their future is is down to those power station operators. We, as Martin has said, have to do, trans uh, do transmission charging effectively against the methodology that Ofgem has approved and uh, Martin's explained about how that's been reformed. So, um, yes, the current transmission charges for Longana are just over £40 million. Once Transmit comes in, assuming that the, um, it gets through the judicial review, um, in 2016, those charges will drop by a third, so to probably about £28, £29 million. Um, I, th I absolutely understand Neil's comments, which is still that puts him at a disadvantage to some other coal-fired stations in other parts of the system. So, uh, but that is a consequence of the of the locational system that we're we're using i think it's important, important, important just to um just on on that because the mike's mike's right in terms of the reduction but the charge was going up anyway under a pre transmit model so that's the pre the reform that's been done Okay, so let me just give you the numbers that would be charged in terms of the actual pounds and show the comparison. And this is for 2017, 2018, which is um, with the transmission upgrades. So Longana, with the reform, is going to be paying 52 million in 1718. Without the reform, it would have been paying 68 million. So there has been a reduction with the reform uh, of, of the numbers there, but the, the, the cost was escalating anyway. Um, a similar plant in the centre of London uh, would receive a payment of £9 million, um, in terms of the current mechanism. And that's... No, you're not going to build a coal plant like that in the centre of London. So, you know, that you know, it would be outside of London, which would increase that that number a little bit towards zero but those are the differences and then and then just again to add to that in terms of, of wind if you've got two gigawatts of wind in the, in a similar zone that would pay 32 million and again you know mike articulated very well the 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 change that has occurred for renewal renewables under that um legislation so th those are the types of numbers that we're talking about in terms of the the differences and that's the current model under Transmit, assuming Long Garnet has got 2,260 megawatts uh, as at 17 and 18. Yeah, it just might be an idea to put a coal, coal fire power station in the middle of London just to see exactly what would change your charging. In my experience, it's ridiculous that you're, you're less a charge for further distribution than you have for production and distribution on the doorstep. Just absolute nonsense. I'm not sure if that was a question or a statement. It's not, it's a statement. <laughs> and it's been, okay, okay, it's we're been here, compounded right. by the fact right, okay, that the numbers we are, we are, here, we are here to ask questions. Right, okay. Patrick Harvey. Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, 
Apologies if this sounds like I'm, I'm going back a wee bit in the conversation, but I just wanted to uh, understand a little bit more about the, uh, the the contract that's being considered in terms of voltage control. Um, the Longan at Peterhead, and I think you said a third bidder, which is. Um, I'm not sure until we finish the process we can reveal who they are, but it's it's someone with a sort of uh, innovative new new idea that they're proposing. Proposing develop. Based in Scotland. Yeah. Okay. It seems odd that you can confirm two of the bidders, but not well, three. Well, I think I think I think two of them are existing generators. That the, the third one will be a new generator. Okay. Um, as I understand it, that is a a, a short term piece of work that's required to deal with a, a one in six hundred year weather event. Is that is that an accurate description of the reason why this this is being done? Yeah. Um, Effectively, we we we've been doing lots of this studies to think about the the risks to Scottish security supply in a scenario with no long and no peterhead, and um, as I say the the key focus is voltage control. One of the questions we were asked, and uh, we've been doing lots of work uh, with Scottish government and Scottish government officials on this, is to try and sort of explain what the size of the risk is, and effectively we you know calculate the sort of risk we're dealing with was about a one in 600 event because once you allow for the fact that you're dealing with low generation availability low wind and in order to actually get the uh, problem you'd need to get a probably a double circuit transmission fault at the same time you get to this very low probability so um effectively we are you know the risk we're dealing with you know yeah, we do have this very, very high uh, reliable system, as 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 I think everybody expects nowadays. That you know they expect just electricity to always be there. Um, so you know we have to think about these extreme risks. And, and this and, this low risk, which you, you feel needs to be yeah. insured against. Let's yeah. let's describe it that way. Uh, is an ongoing one, or one that only exists until uh, some of the the wider grid upgrades, like the the Western Link, have come into, into being. It will get a lot lower once those those grid upgrades come in, and therefore uh, we believe that as long as those grid upgrades come in on time, um, then we don't believe we'll need any more services to meet so, the risk. So just turning to, to Mr Clitheroe in, in that context, even if you were to win this bid, it gives you a year or two's grace, no more than that. Is that is that fair? Um, that is fair. The, the contract that's gone out is, for, is really dependent on the completion of the the western hvdc so the current contract is for 18 months with a 12 month extension so you know 30 months from april 16 would be uh, uh, the expectation and that that still though takes us beyond the period at which uh, long Ghana, if it's still operational would have to meet the new sulfur dioxide standards under the um Industrial Emissions Directive, is that right? Um, the, yeah, the, the nitrous oxide, yes. Uh, and are you are you at that point? Well, the 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 the, the new uh, environmental requirements start in April sixteen. So, um, we'll just say that by that time you will comply with them. Um, well, well, we have to comply with them. So, and there's two ways of com- well, the only way of complying with them is to stay below your your NOx emissions in terms of how much you, you produce. You've got two options to that. Either you produce less or you um, in, invest in new technology so you can produce more with less nitrous oxide output. So, you know, at Longana, we have invested in uh, a couple of systems on one of our units to reduce our nitrous oxide output from generally about 550 milligrams down to 350 milligrams 300 milligrams to have the plant with full 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 output up at 12 13 terawatt hours it needs to be below 200 milligrams and there's to be another level of investment in that and so you would need further investment that you haven't yet made in order to to move from the the current directive standards to the the new directive standards that are for coming for full output yes for full output yes so so you haven't made that that investment to comply with that. Well, we've standard. made we've made the uh, obviously the first stage of the investment was the investment in sulfur dioxide reduction, which we've made. We spent two hundred and fifty million on that. We've made um, small investments at the moment in in nitrous oxide, which have started to have a 
uh, an impact. Um, to justify the full investment to get below 200, which which I might add, not not many coal plants in the UK have done. Um, um, you know, the the economics for the plant would have to be there for the rest of the decade and into the next decade, and and because of a combination of factors that I talked through earlier in terms of the, the carbon floor price doesn't change with that, the um, transmission charges don't change with that, then that those economics are not there to justify the full investment. So we can still, you know, under the current, if we did no more investment, we could still um, output just, just under six terawatt hours and then we'd step yeah. up that investment um, in terms of what's there. No, I mean, I, I think we all, pretty much everybody would accept that ongoing coal capacity of that scale isn't compatible with the, the UK or Scotland's climate change objectives anyway. So that's that's clearly not going to happen. So you're saying that you're not intending to put in that investment in order to uh, meet that, those new emission standards uh, in terms of full capacity because of that, that context. So we're, we're Be- still talking about when, not if. Oh, I, we, well, absolutely. We, we are talking about when not if and and the 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 plan for scottish power has always been to try and to get to 2020 with this plant because we feel a a balanced portfolio um across um not just the uk but our own fleet so we're as you know we're a a massive investor in renewables and we continue to invest in renewables um we've also got planning permissions for two gas plant that the economics need to be right at, uh, one in England, one in Scotland. Um, and, and obviously Longana, we always expected that, that, you know, toward the end of the decade that this plant would either run out of its bubble under IED or uh, something would change that would enable us to invest and keep it going. But there's a new level of environmental legislation in 2023, uh, which is probably the maximum you can get to with a with a coal plant at the moment. But yes, is the answer, direct answer to your question in terms of, you know, what we're talking about here is a three to four year period to the end of the decade. And and just finally returning to to Mr. Calvio as, as well, the the the. The context of those transmission upgrades, the, the Western Link and others, and potentially uh, additional links which haven't yet been uh, been approved uh, across the North Sea, that that longer term context really changes the the question about the the need for ongoing thermal generation in Scotland at all, doesn't it? There wouldn't be, from a security or supply point of view, an engineering need for that kind of thermal generation in Scotland. Uh- I think you're right that as you build more transmission and, you know, Western Link, obviously, the, the knee case is all about exporting Scottish renewables. Um, it, and it, has a sort of, it has a sort of secondary benefit that it can therefore also help with importing to Scotland. Um, but as you build more transmission, you become less, you know, reliant on local generation. Um, you know, Scotland is still, you know, got an awful lot of generation in it and a lot planning to connect. So, um, but, you know, certainly if you look across the GB system, where you've had areas of the network that have been very reliant on local generators in the you know what's tended to happen in the long run is as those generators become economic or uh you know um you know at, a, at an age where they it's not economic to keep them running we've generally reinforced the transmission system to a point where we don't need it so and that's happened in all parts of the country so you know um you, expect over time to be less dependent on local generation to meet our peak demand but still able to use local generation to export if we're producing more than we need over over the more than we consume over the year i think that's right yeah thank you can i maybe just yeah. come come, Please, yeah. come back on on one thing on the the, the one in 600 event that the you know and that and clearly that that is that is related to a um uh, as it said in in, in, in National Grid's letter, that the Peter Head and Long Gannett were unavailable. There was a low probability one in 600 event brought about by extreme weather affecting the electricity network, that, and that very much relates to a, a loss of a loss of load and some of the some of the really extreme black star situations that you'd find um, in and the con the contract itself. And I'm sure Mike can add to this is about voltage control which happens every minute of every day on the network. And I think that's, that's an, imp- an important sort of point of clarity. Um, you know, to give you a, a, a small example from last summer, which I think is a, a good example, is um, 
the, 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 you know, the power price dropped through the summer and therefore Longanet was in a, in a loss-making position last summer for a couple of months. So we basically started to turn the station off for a couple of months like we, you know, like obviously we planned to do because each marginal unit wouldn't make any money. Um, but to provide voltage support services to National Grid, we were actually traded back on every day last summer. There was no point last summer where Longana went down to zero. There was always one or two units on to provide that support because that's the the service that Longana was delivering into the network. And it's just, you know, that that's how the network's been running in Scotland for many years, as I say. And, it, you know, a good example was last summer because in, in an economic sense, we would have turned the station off for two months and brought it back on for the autumn and winter. I appreciate you need to bat for your team to a certain extent, but you wouldn't suggest that that's the only way that service can be delivered? Um, no, just the way it's been delivered over the last few years. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm conscious we're, we've got about 25 minutes or so left. I've got five members to come in uh, who I'll try and get through. It'd be helpful if we didn't go over old ground, though, because I think we've, we've, we've exhausted quite a few of these issues uh, as far as we can. Um, so it'd be helpful if we could have kind of novel, novel um, angles. Um, Richard Lyle, start with you. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll not go over. So, I mean, I'll give you a novel ang angle. Um, Security of supply in, in, in the year is now 2025. So 10 years from now, we've lost Lungan at 16.7%. Peterhead not on, 8.7%. Hunterston closing in 2023, 7.1%. Torness, 8.8%. So that's 41.3% away from the, the whole electricity supply. We, at this moment in time, for 30 years, Scottish Power have said we export to England or whatever uh, supply. So you're saying in the document 28% exporting uh, in uh, this year. So take 28% off of 41.3%, we're minus 13.3% of the electricity supply. So in 10 years' time, 2025, how can you assure me, and I know we can talk about renewables uh, and, and what what's driving on, but how can you support, secure me uh, and uh, ensure that the ordinary Mr and Mrs punter out in the street can put the lights on in 2025 if all these stations are away in Scotland. Mike Calvey, I think. That's for anyone. Or <laughs> that guy. Um, I think there's no doubt as, you know, there's a lot of change potentially planned. Um, you know, we do look further out. Inevitably, when you look further out, you have longer time to do anything about it and you also have longer uncertainty. So we, we tend to analyse these scenarios, but don't necessarily, you know, think about what we might do, but not necessarily pull the trigger until we get closer to them and a bit more certainty. And I certainly know that EDF, I think, would be hoping to life extend their nuclear plant. So they might still be open 2025. You know, you, do, you, you don't know. You might, yeah, you, you find out near the time. Um, I think effectively, as was talked about in the previous question, as the system evolves, then it's, you know, one, you know, there will be further investment in generation, mainly renewables, but it might be different sorts of renewables with different characteristics that provide more diversity. So if more marine comes on, that will probably be operating in different times in the wind. So that would uh, provide a benefit. Um, clearly, if CCS happens, that will provide a long term base load um, option. Um, and as all that generation plant shuts, the way the transmission charging regime works is they naturally rebalance. So as soon as effectively there is not enough base load generation in Scotland to meet Scottish demand, then effectively the signals would ra radically reduce and even flip um, around. So, you know, the, the, it's meant to be cost reflective. And if we get to the point where Scotland is much more reliant on uh, imports from Scotland most of the time, then you would actually see the generation charge in Scotland come down massively um, and, and the demand charge go up. And that's, that's the way that the, the network works. So there would then be a market signal. And as if new, say, CCGTs have been developed across GB, then it's certainly possible that um, one or more might develop, develop in Scotland. So there's quite a few ifs and buts in there. And, you know, in, in those timescales, inevitably, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of, you know, there's all sorts of things that might, might, might play out in those timescales. I think the key point is probably the one we said earlier, is that ultimately, if there is any concerning scenarios about not enough local Scottish generation, 
in those timescales, we do have time to d d bring forward further transmission investments in order to secure the network. And, and effectively, we plan the system under a very robust systematic process to spot these issues coming and to make sure there is a, 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 a network that we can secure to the security standards. Jim Smith, what yeah. Um, I maybe I just wanted to clarify something. I mean, around Peterhead, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about long and Peterhead closing. I mean, the first thing to say is that we, we've not said that Peterhead is going to close. I have said, uh, and, and we have said, that it's economically challenging at the moment. But, you know, we are, uh, through a number of things, working to try and get through this particularly challenging period. As I say, we're investing to make the plant more flexible for this winter coming. Uh, through uh, potentially winning ancillary service contracts like the voltage contract I mentioned previously uh, and the one that's currently uh, in play, we hope to mitigate some of the uh, the losses that we're seeing in the plant. And that's a, that's obviously a very short-term thing. Peterhead is a, is a modern gas fire power station. It's got, it's got the capability to operate well beyond 2030. Uh, so your scenario of 2025 Peterhead close is not necessarily one that will happen. Uh, and through CCS if CCS goes ahead, and of course there is the fact that, you know, at some point we would hope to see a market recovery in the wholesale market for thermal plant, then, you know, Peter Ed could still have a long-term future in the Scottish generation market. In addition to the, those points, by 2025, um, we will have billions of pounds more invested in the transmission system. There are a number of upgrades, not just the Western Link, but also the Caithness Moray project and others. Um, which will lead us to have a much stronger transmission system to support um, security supply uh, by the time we get out there. We would expect demand response to play a much bigger role in, in helping meet security of supply, so that's another change over that period. And we would then be into about the sixth or seventh year of the capacity mechanism, which is intended to help as well with long-term signals for investment in generation. So there's a number of factors by the time we get to 2025. There's no perfect guarantees, but... There's an, a number of tools in place to help ensure we have security supply over that period. Right, sure. yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jordan McCarthy. Thank you very much, convener. Um, just start with a, a question for the National Grid. The National Grid's undertaken a system study of Scotland, and last month the First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister asking for that to be put into the public domain, along with all the background reports that accompanied it. It's still not in the public domain. Can you tell us where it will be? Yeah, that um, <coughs> request, I'm not sure it's actually come straight to us, but we, we, you know, we did this system study jointly with Scottish Power Transmission and She Transmission. We've shared it extensively with Scottish Government um, and, um, in, and, and including some advisory boards. Um, and we've also shared it, as you might um, expect, with Ofgem and with uh, uh, UK Government. Um, we are very happy to put it in the public domain um, and, you know, we will get it published in our website. You know, it probably will probably do it once we finish the current procurement exercise so we can put effectively a whole package of stuff in in one go. But effectively, we, we're very happy to publish it. Can you publish it now? Well, I think it's just effectively we just need to get it up on our website and just make sure that the, the, the only issues we have to worry about are any sort of commercial sensitivities around individual um, generating stations so uh, you know we I mean uh, you know but effectively I would anticipate it being published in a matter of weeks right I don't quite understand why it's so difficult to get something on a website would you share well, it with this committee now I, I'm very happy to send it to this committee now um, yeah. after you leave here today yeah <laughs> right okay thank you very much um, you've mentioned on a couple of occasions um, the increase in, in wind power, particularly from Scotland, but also the intermittency of supply. The Institute of Mechanical Engineers conducted um, uh, published a report last year that showed that um, the UK's energy storage capacity was way behind um, other countries. So we're not even the top 10 for energy storage. Um, have you any, right across the panel, any thoughts of why that should be? Is electricity market reform not encouraging the development of energy storage capacity in the UK? Sorry. I mean, I guess globally, if, we talk, if you're talking about electricity storage rather than energy storage, um, clearly for energy storage, we have lots of gas storage and so on. But in terms of electricity, most of the storage that exists across Europe now is, is um, in hydroelectric systems with pumped storage. We tend to have less hydro systems than countries like Norway and Switzerland and Austria and so on because of our geography. Um, we have, clearly have some in Scotland, we have some in, in Wales, but it's, 
the costs of having pump storage sites in GB are higher than in some other countries. Therefore, we tend to have less and rely more on gas plant and um, another plant for faster response. Um, we are very keen to see new forms of storage come onto the system over the next few years, whether that's you know, battery storage. We've um, funded innovation trials on, on the networks looking at some of these issues. Um, so we're very keen to see those things develop, as are many other countries across um, Europe. They're not widespread anywhere at the moment. Um, the current stats on, on electricity storage will be primarily about pump storage. I mean, the, you say it's not widespread anywhere, but we're not in the top 10 in the world. Our European competitors are ahead of us, and the Institute of Mechanical Engineers says that we need to increase our capacity considerably. Are you, are you aware of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers' report? I'm not aware of that specific report. But... I'm, I, I'm aware of the report. I mean, I think um, the issue with the report, it seems to presuppose that you can say what the right amount of storage is. I mean, my view is that storage has a number of potential uses and if it can become more economic with a sort of innovative new technology like batteries like flywheels or whatever then it can play a massive role both in terms of helping with intermittent generation in terms of smart grid applications you know we are very interested in how we might be able to use storage to provide some of these sort of balancing services voltage control things that we've been talking about so we are very enthusiastic about the technology but the reality is at the moment is that it's not economic and you know now that might change in the next few years but so i think to say there's not enough i think is you know is is presupposing you know what the right answer is which um i'm not sure how you know to me that's why you have a market and if the market says it, it's economic it will be developed well, you can, you can, you can, maybe like jim smith yeah, oh, yeah, and to, to come in and oh, i was going to say yeah i mean you know pump storage is obviously the the tried proven method of electricity storage never mind any new technology so I, I do sometimes wonder why people get sort of all worked up about battery storage when we've got a proven technology that works. I mean, we, we do have a, a consent to, to build, as I'm sure everyone's aware, a pump storage in the north of Scotland, which is, is actually a little bit different to both Foyers and Crewe and, and indeed to Norway and Fist and Elgin, that it's, it's built with a very large storage capacity, uh, unlike these, which are really built to store maybe seven or eight hours of their capacity for, uh, to deal with the peaks. Uh, but unfortunately, the market mechanisms don't exist to justify the investment. Yeah, ju just to pick up on that point and, and Mr. Calvo's point, I mean, nucle nuclear power isn't economic either, but it's getting huge subsidies from the UK government. So, you know, like, so why is it okay for nuclear power not to be economic and to get investment, but not energy storage? That's a question for the UK government as to what they choose <laughs> to support, isn't it? Would you that? All energy technologies, could you? Anyway, thank you. Um, Lewis MacDonald. I wanted to pursue the issue of the medium term, and I think from what Jim Smith said in answer to a previous question, Peter Head is working on a number of different options in terms of the medium term. Uh, my deduction from that is that the, the short-term bid that you are engaged in this month is not vital to the future success of Peter Head, although it's partly your bigger plan would that be a fair part of one of the things you're doing in order to maintain that station? as i say the the economics of peter Ed are currently challenging and uh, you know what, what you would say well why keep going well we've always hoped and felt that we could uh, secure some ancillary services from national grid to help contribute to the upkeep of the station uh, in this sort of short term period and uh, you know, as I think Mike said, he, he's got an obligation to find the uh, the most economically beneficial uh, a solution to his problem so we've put a bid in and we're obviously keen to to be successful yeah, so there's a number and carbon capture you mentioned as well as a, a, a key part of that prospect i wonder if we could ask neil clitheroe from scottish Power. we've heard from you of the one contract that you're bidding for which clearly is important from your point of view are there any other items in the fire that the committee should know about in terms of the work you're doing to maintain this station to 2020 no not really no no we you know, ultimately, with power plants and with you know, as Jim said, with gas plant, you generally sort of suffer through the through the difficult times with the expectation the market's going to change. So, in the early nineties, both Kakenzie and Longana didn't didn't um, make any money for a number of years, and and we kept the plants going, um, such that 
over three, four years, such that in the end the market changes and, and you have an opportunity there. The, the, the difference today is that, is that there's an acceptance that coal is in a very difficult situation in the UK network and therefore the likelihood of, of some um, something going to happen in the future which makes coal significantly more profitable where you can ride out the difficult time with an expectation in two or three years hence making money to recover that is, is extremely unlikely. So, ther so therefore you get to the point where you have to take action today and that's and that's what the, that's what we've tried to do. And obviously, we're doing all the things you'd expect of us: making the plant more flexible to try and deliver services to to National Grid. You know, managing the cost base, managing all of our contracts, everything we can to try and try and you know bring the cost down and make the plant in a in a better situation. But the work that's being done elsewhere and carbon capture from coal is not work that's of any interest from the point of view. Of uh, no, no. All right, thank you. Um, Cara Hilton. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, most of my questions have been stolen. <laughs> right. Um, I've just a question for the national grid. I guess you said earlier that um, decisions um, were down to um, power station operators, but in the briefing that you issued last week on security of supply, you said that you were committed um, to applying your expertise to developing sustainable energy solutions for the UK. And I want to know more about how, what does this mean for Long Anna? Does it involve um, exploring an alternative future option for the site um, and for the workforce? Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate or our role to effectively um, look at individual power stations and, and, and you know, what the best options for that site is and for their workforce. I mean, clearly that, that for Long Gannett, Scottish Power have to take decisions and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, Neil has talked about his plans. Um, ultimately, you know, we look at the overall GB network. We have a clear obligation to make sure that network can be secured in real time and that the flows can go where they need to go. And as you said, you know, we are committed to, you know, doing our bit to help move to a more sustainable decarbonised system. So there's a lot of investment going on in the transmission network across the whole of GB in order to allow you know new low carbon generation to to to, to connect. And uh, you know, so we do see ourselves having a big role in terms of that sustainable future. Um, but as you said, sort of the individual uh, st decisions on individual power stations are down to those power station operators. It's a follow-up, um, probably for the whole panel, really. Um, you talk about investment in the transmission network, and I wonder what the panel feel is the likelihood of a new gas-fired replacement for Long Anna, and what conditions would have to be met for this to happen. Um, it it would be very, very unlikely at the moment, given the the difference in the economics between. Uh, Locating a gas plant in Scotland versus locating one in the southeast of England, it would, you know, effectively you're going into one capacity auction, which is a UK auction, um, with no, no, there's no obvious, there's no locational things within that auction, um, so you're bidding against all these other plants across the UK, um, and and effectively you you've got a an economic situation where the charge is higher in Scotland versus elsewhere. Therefore, if you're getting a fixed price somewhere, you know, fixed price for your capacity, you're gonna you're gonna try and put the plant in the in the place that has the the lowest fixed cost because that's the the most economic. And when there's only maybe one, you can't predict what's going to happen in future auctions. But in the last auction, there's just one plant that was new in the UK uh, you know I'm sure in the next auctions there'll be one maybe two plants in each in each auction then those plants will obviously be located where the transmission charges are the lowest because everything else is the same in terms of that those plants so to take that example I think the, the plant that was successful in the capacity auction wasn't located where transmission charges are lowest it was located in the, the north of England rather than the south but I, I do agree you know, with the, the driving factors that Neil was talking about, clearly it's less likely that the new gas plant at the moment would be located in, in Scotland than, it, than in England. There are a range of factors, including um, ability to get planning consent, land prices, gas prices, which also vary um, locationally, and the electricity charges. Um, 
I suspect it would need, over time, there to be a different balance of demand and supply in Scotland um, and in the rest of the country, which could lead to, to transmission charges then changing. So I wouldn't certainly rule it out over the future, I think, but I agree at the moment it looks less likely. And, and that's, the, you know, that's why we've got options. You know, We have an option at um, our old Kakenzi site for a gas plant, but also an option at our uh, Dam Hague Creek site in the southeast, and that's the one that we entered into into last year's auction. I, think, I, mean, I can't remember if, if yourself, Martin, or you, Mike, were suggesting that if, the, if there were a drop-off of generated capacity in Scotland, that the transmission charging regime would then flip around and make it make it uh, more more viable. Is that is that the case? Yes. Yes, you said that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. Yeah, Cara, you. I've just got one um, final point, yeah. um, please. It's just mainly for Scottish Power, and touched on this before, but obviously this is a really worrying time for workers and their families and probably more worrying after today's session, I think, to be fair. Um, if, so if the decision goes the, long way, the wrong way for Long Anna and the contract's not awarded, what would be the time scale to cease generation on the site? Um, if, in, 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 you know, in terms of the, the, what I said earlier, then the March 2016 was the, the position we would be, we would be looking at for, for the site. Now that, that assumes that the, transmission goes to zero and effect with the the station uh, at that point um would would close um obviously in terms of um the the potential deal with national grid um then that would mean that the the transmission would drop um not down to zero it would it would be above that uh, and therefore you know the 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 workforce and everything would would accommodate that that lower that lower level of transmission um you know scottish power have obviously um two or three years ago shut uh shut the kakenzie plant um um and um a lot of the staff at that plant um you know some of them moved to our longana plant in terms of the workforce there some of them got jobs elsewhere in Scottish Power, you know, in terms of the metering businesses, the network businesses, and obviously some of the employees took took early retirement and, and we managed to, like we always do, we always manage the um, um, employee base as, as best we can to, to either provide a, a future at Scottish Power or, or to uh, to provide the, the early retirement voluntary severance um plans that we always that we always provide and always have provided for the last um well since we've since we existed john Lemon. Yeah. Um, thank you very much you, you spoke about the postage stamp model um if i can ask scotch power what would be the price of the postage stamp for you if transmission costs were defined in that way um Geez, that's a good question. Um, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I'm not entirely. I'm not, not entirely sure on that. It, it, it depends. It depends on the sort of model that will be developed um, in terms of whether um, it was a postage stamp with the same split at the moment between generation and demand. Whether it would just be applied to demand. Um, you know what that proportion would be. Um, I, I suppose the, the key thing I look at at the moment is the difference between um, what um, what we pay today and what other other coal plants pay pay across the UK is the key sort of difference that I that I look at, um, and, and that's you know that that's that's where the the sort of the, the issue comes in in terms of this plant. Um, I, I suppose the the key would be what the construction of that is, but that's you know. It, it takes a long time to change transmission charges. You know, the, the current project, Transmit, commenced in 2008, 2010, so I think the initial proposal's eight, 2010, and they're coming now into, a, into effect uh, next year. So it's not, it's not an overnight thing. There's a lot of, a lot of debate, because it's got a lot of consequences, a lot of transition consequences to occur on that postage stamp model of delivering service an entirely legitimate one in terms of consumers is not something extreme so no you know from your point of view it would benefit you i don't know what the balance of winners and losers would be in terms of people who would but that would be something worth 
while reflecting on because I do think from um, off Gem's argument seems to be this model is in the interest of consumers, a postage stamp model wouldn't be. I think that's pretty high. I would argue that's highly contentious, um, given that it's an entirely legitimate way to, to, to deliver things. I suppose, um, you know, we're, we're not talking about having a lot of time here. What would the transmission costs need to be for you to be able to function beyond 2016? We would be if we were in the same, if we we're in the same, you know, the, the model that we looked at was if we were paying like a 10 million transmission cost, which I think is the equivalent to to the sort of Midlands area. If we're paying around that 10 million instead of paying the, 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 the 40, uh, the 40 million, then you can, the, the plant will not, you know, the plant would su just survive in terms of the, 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 the break even and that would you know, enable us to fight another day. Um, when it was suggested that um, National Grid might have a role in terms of, you know, beyond, you, you, I think you made the point this was there was a matter for plant operators, but would National Grid not accept that you're defining, to some extent, the ability of plant operators to operate if you, if you stick to a transmission cost regime that means it disproportionately disbenefits Long Island in comparison with other plants? Well, we understand that our transmission charges will have an impact and effectively they are designed to provide the cost effective signal that Martin's talked about. Um, as, as Neil says, you know, changing, you know, we're, 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 we're currently um, planning to implement a major change next year subject to judicial review. So making further changes in the short term seems pretty hard to achieve. Um, you know, and, you know, you know, there are different ways, you know, even if Longanic closed some of its capacity, that would reduce the transmission charges to all the other generation in Scotland. So it's quite a dynamic system. Um, Your decision to stick to transmission costs has a consequence for Longanit, which is it, out with their control. It has a consequence for all generators on the system. And specifically uh, for Longanit, Longanit, it may yeah. mean that Longanit might close. So you do have a... And, and therefore I would ask of Gem the same question that sticking to a model which says it's in the interest of consumers will have a consequence for long, long on it. So have you looked again at your view on this in terms of benefit to consumers? Since we looked at that over the course of, um, as, as has been said, several years, um, our estimate is, is that in the longer term it would cost several billions of pounds more for consumers um, to move to a, a system of everyone paying the same. As I said, m many other countries have market designs with locational signals um, in the charges. It's part of the European target model that has been agreed at, at European level. Um, you know, yes, it has impacts on, on individual plants. It's not entirely outside their control, as has been said. Um, if they reduce capacity, then they, they pay less. Um, and we see, for the year in question, really, which is 2016-17, um, we see Don Gannett's charging charges falling by more than £10 million. Um, you know, clearly, it's, that's not to a level that is a level that they want that they would choose. But within the legal framework we operate, making individual decisions just to give a bit more money to one company rather than another is is not something that's open to us. Well, it, it, it is a choice of model, and there are other choice of model that are entirely legitimate, which would have different impacts in different plants. You've chosen a model which has specific impact, I think. And it was the last question I would ask in terms of the broader consequences of... I mean, you talked about Kakenzie workers having moved to Long Island. Presumably, a significant number of your workforce are skilled, and therefore, Long Island, you might argue, is a place which generates a demand for skilled jobs, which has an impact on um, local drivers around skills, so opportunities for people to... or incentives for people to take up particular kinds of jobs. Is there any work being done by anyone on the panel around the impact of closing Long Island on the development of high levels engineering skills or whatever within those communities more broadly for Scotland? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the, the first thing to, to, to say is just, to, you know, in terms of the job situation overall, as I said, there's 270 permanent employees. There's another 160 as permanent supplier employees on site and at each major outage we 
we bring in between five and seven hundred um, other employees from from our suppliers. Um, and there's a hundred small business suppliers receive regular business from Longana, totaling ten million per annum. So it, it's a hub for the local the local economy in terms, you know, as well as other major industrial plants that we know of in that local economy. It's it's a it's a hub that's there. In terms of Scottish Power, we um, we have strong um, apprentice programs that we run across our energy networks business, which which runs across Scotland. So we're always looking at reskilling people, retraining people to to assist in that transition. Uh, obviously, we've also got good connections with other employers uh, across Scotland. Um, that you know, when these types of things happen, there's there's, there's always some parts of the um, economy, uh, uh, some part, some sort of these jobs are, are growing, and therefore you can move people across to them. And we'll we'll throw every every tool we can at, at managing managing a, uh, what what could be a, a difficult situation. Obvious examples across Scottish industry where people have retained jobs in order to retain the skills for when the market picks up again, and it doesn't feel to me as if that's something that's even across the desk of those who are making decisions which have a consequence for Langanet. It, it's, it, it, maybe for, it's a matter for Scottish Government to look for, at for, in terms of an industrial and economic strategy whether the things they should be doing in order yeah. to maintain skills while the market is, is not being helpful. Yeah, I, think, I think that's more of a rhetorical question than one to the panel, but if anybody's keen to answer it. Well, for, for Scottish Power, we've, we've got some extremely skilled, dedicated people at Longana and our aim is to is always to try and find opportunities for for those people should should the status of the plant change okay. um, I appreciate there are other members keen to come in but we are already over time we have another panel um, uh, to, to hear from so can I uh, thank you all for coming along this morning it's been a long session and we covered a lot of ground but it's been extremely useful uh, thank you to you all and we'll now have a short suspension
can uh, reconvene. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome our second panel. We're joined uh, by Councillor Tom Adams uh, from Fife Council and Robin Presswood, of, who's Head of Service, Economy, Planning and Employability Services. Thank you to you both uh, for coming along. Um, I think you were, you were here to hear the uh, evidence we, we got uh, earlier about uh, Long Gannett. Um, I mean, just to summarise it, we, we've always known Long Gannett's likely to close by 2020. Um, there is now a prospect of that closure being brought forward, if, if I recall correctly what Scottish Power said, if they don't win this contract with the National Grid, the closure could be brought forward to March 2016. And clearly there are very serious implications for the uh, Fife economy if that were to uh, take place. Uh, I wonder if you could just maybe start by just explaining a little bit about uh, what uh, Fife Council uh, has been doing in relation to this issue um, uh, and what initial thoughts you might have about um, uh, the impact on the West Fife economy should Longanic close early as, as was being uh, suggested. Th thanks very much, Camille. I'll, I'll start off, and Councillor Adams will come in around uh, the economic impact and, and particularly around the supply chain. So I think that's an important point. I think the, the first point to emphasise is we, we, we were asked here to talk about the economic impact of closure, and we will do that. But uh, I think the first point that both of us want to get across is that we're, we're here primarily as part of the campaign um, to support Longana in a longer term transition to a cleaner form of power generation. Um, and the, the, the views put forward um, by Mr Clitheroe from Scottish Power, I think, are very similar to the views of the Council. We've always had very good relationships with, with Scottish Power. They've been a good employer. Uh, they've gone out of their way to do community engagement well. Um, they've been a high-quality employer, uh, and th th they've always been a, an excellent partner with the Council. And the Council passed a motion recently of support for um, the campaign against premature closure of Long Gannett. Um, and there is a unified cross-party position uh, on the council around that. In, in terms of economic impact, we're obviously focused correctly um, this morning on the 260 direct employees uh, at Long Gannett. Um, but towards the end of uh, Mr Clitheroe's contribution, he talked about the, the, the supply chain. I think he gave a figure of potentially five to 700 people in the supply chain and contractors. And that chimes with our analysis, which we've done just using standard industry multipliers, um, which are available through Scottish Government. Um, and, and we'd estimate that potentially there were around 600 indirect jobs uh, which depend on the facility and an additional 200 induced jobs, which would be uh, jobs in local shops and, um, and hospitality facilities which are uh, supported by the wages coming out of the plant. So from, from our perspective, we believe it's not about 260 direct employees, it's about 1,000 um, jobs uh, across the central belt. Um, not, not just in West Fife Villages and in Long Island, it's uh, Kincardine itself, um, but across the, the central belt. So very, very significant uh, impact. And I think that's the context that we must see it in, in terms of um, any response to any potential um, closure situation. Um, Particularly, I know Councillor Adams wants to come in and talk about the impact on the coal industry, and I'm sure members won't need any um, history lesson from me on the recent um, phenomenal pressures on the coal industry and the ups and downs of that uh, Scottish Government Coal Task Force, which is a very important part of the response. Uh, and clearly, Long Gannett does consume a, a very large amount of coal from uh, the remaining Scottish open cast mines, including two, um, Muirdine and, and St Ninians, I think, are still both supplying um, the plant at the present time. So there'll be a, a very significant impact on that. So there'll be an economic impact, but there'll be an impact in terms of um, the, the restoration and the environmental impact of those operations uh, and the ability of the operators to, to ensure a, a, an orderly um, restoration strategy. Um, so, so Fife Council's position is very clear. We support um, the position as, as articulated by Scottish Power and the need for um, a, an orderly rundown and transition of the site. Uh, if the economic circumstances are correct, we broadly would be supportive of a transition to uh, a cleaner form of thermal generation on the site. We think there's an incredibly important infrastructure uh, at Long Gannett, which shouldn't go to waste. It's, it's strategically well located for Scotland. I think we don't anticipate that uh, a replacement facility wouldn't require to be anything like as large as Long Gannett. Um, but uh, certainly looking beyond the 2020 horizon that, that uh, Mr Clodro set out, um, we do believe that uh, if the economic circumstances and the charging regime changed, um, then a, a gas 
uh, fired CCG, CCGT um, would be probably a, a beneficial option um, for us to explore. Um, I, I, I suppose there, there is a degree of frustration within the community and within the council. I'm sure Councillor Adams would like to articulate that a little bit more. Um, we, we believe that we should have had five to ten years to plan for this transition. And realistically, it's only been since October last year that we've had any real visibility of the potential of closure uh, of the facility in 2016. Um, the, the types of things that we would have um, liked to have done is to lessen King Carden and, and, and the West Fife Village's dependence on that large single employer. Um, we would like to do more work around enterprise and entrepreneurship to, to stimulate a startup culture there and get many more smaller firms. We would like to ensure that there's um, a supply of physical business infrastructure, employment land and, and facilities for start-up businesses, perhaps a business incubator, small industrial units, uh, to again provide alternatives to the, the, sort of the large single employer that we have. Uh, and, and we would certainly like to pick up um, an accelerated strategy around those with support from uh, the other partners. Uh, and again, Councillor Adams w w would like to say a little bit more about that. I think finally, um, in the event that the station does close, there's a well-trodden path um, through the PACE multi-agency response group, which Scottish Government um, and uh, the Council, DWP and Skills Development Scotland would jointly lead on. So there would be a, a strong response to support the existing workforce in considering other options through that. Um, and uh, we would want probably some kind of task force approach similar to the halls of Broxburn uh, task force or, 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 or other similar major closures uh, might re require a, a multi-council response because clearly the economic impact will not stop at the boundaries of Fife. It will go uh, across the central belt in, into Falkirk, into Clack Manager, into Stirling. Uh, into Perth and Kinross and further south. So we would need to engage with uh, partner councils as well as part of that approach. But I'll, I'll hand over those words to Councillor Adams. Thank you, Robin. Uh, if, if I could maybe just concentrate a wee bit on the supply chain here, where if, if you look at where coal's coming in from just now, there's, there's, if, if we're speaking about 5 million tonnes getting burnt at long on it. You have that supply chain where coal's coming in around the world, it's coming into Hunterston, then getting shipped for Hunterston into Long Gunnett, whether that be by road haulage or even trains. The impact then that has, if, if we have a, which is a clear and present danger here, or a premature closure of Long Gunnett, the impact that will have on the economy in Fife is absolutely horrendous. Speaking as I uh, actually worked in Long Gunnett, the, in the coal industry in Long Gunnett, which closed uh, 12 years ago, and the local economy is just now starting to pick up for that closure. It was quite a severe closure, and there wasn't really anything in position for when that industry closed. If you look at it now, you have uh, the hauliers are in danger. You have even the Alloa to King Carden rail link, which there, there is significant amount of transport on that rail link. I'm not sure it would close, but it's quite a major economic impact that would have on it. The the two local uh, coal mines that are feeding into the open cast sites, both in between them employ around about five hundred employees. Again it's a huge impact. What what we're actually asking for here today is if that premature closure happens, we we'd be looking for a task group to be set up which would probably include Scottish Power, Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government and Fife Council, with significant funding put into that so that we could then enable people to go into apprenticeships and then secure long-term employment for those that aren't directly involved as well in the Long Gunnett Power Station. What, what we're looking for is the whole central belt of Scotland, but most of all in the West Fife villages, and the local community, King Carden, and also just across the water there uh, in Alloa and places like that. So it's, it's quite a huge uh, problem that's going to arise, and we would look for a lot of help from organisations like that. OK, th th thank you very much to, to you both. Just before I bring others in, just to, just to t tease out a couple of issues. Um, I think you said, you're, Mr Presswood, and, and you echoed this, Mr Councillor Adams, uh, your preference would be to see a replacement for, for Longana, and you mentioned a, a, 
uh, a gas-fired um, generating station. Um, have you had any discussions with Scottish Power around that as a as a prospect? Um, I, I speak fairly regularly. We, we, we engage with all the major employers in Fife, and um, given Scottish Power's importance, I, I manage the relationship personally. Um, so we're aware that that, from their point of view, is technically feasible, but not commercially viable at this time. Um, so, so that probably, if if the overall um, economic um, circumstances surrounding thermal power generation in Scotland were to change, Scottish Power would certainly be keen to explore that again. I think that's consistent with the answer that Mike Clitheroe uh, gave earlier on. Um, we, we, we believe it would be smaller than the capacity at Long Um We don't see any regulatory hurdles. It, it would almost certainly be a Scottish Government consent rather than Fife Council, so I can, I can say that without prejudicing my position as, as, as Head of Planning. Um, but we um, we believe that it's broadly consistent with both Scottish Government and Fife Council planning policy, so I don't see any major headaches with, with that uh, from a consenting point of view. OK, and, and if, if there were no replacement power generating capacity, um, is there anything on that site that could replace these jobs or come even close? It's certainly a very large site, um, so it physically has the capacity to be um, converted or probably not the main power station itself, but some of the ancillary buildings could potentially be converted. And where we've seen large-scale closures in the past, uh, one of the options is to, is to bring some capital to the table, convert, for example, workshops or, or offices into a business incubation space. Maybe that's not feasible, and, and a, a complete removal of all the, the estate is, is, is required, um, and, and therefore building somewhere else on the estate, a new build proposition, perhaps a small business park, um, with a, a business incubator, some terraced workshops, um, just to um, provide options for accommodations for small and growing businesses in the local area. Okay, but that's not going to come anywhere near the, what were you talking about, 500 to 700 jobs? Uh, well, dependent I, I think, on, on, uh, on the, the station at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the thousand jobs figure, if you, if you take that as, as something which is broadly consistent between the point the Scottish Power set out and, and, and the view that Councillor Adams and I have expressed, um, that would be distributed across Scotland. Typically, um, if, if you build a business park over a period perhaps of 10 years, you create um, 60 to 70 jobs per hectare. So a 10 hectare business park, by the time it's completely developed, might have six to 700 employees on it. And I think given the strategic location um, of Long Island at King Garden, uh, next to the, the, the new bridge, uh, well connected for many communities, we, we, we certainly see over a period of time if we could um, put some capital investment into business incubation and the business park, we could um, gradually grow the workforce back up. But it wouldn't be, uh, as you say, an overnight transformation um, because it, it would take time for businesses to grow and for, for businesses to move into the area. Okay, thank you. Um, check one. Good morning. Good morning, Robin. I know from Days in Dundee and, and uh, in Fife. When did you first know of the real danger? I mean, I know you say you, you talk to them regularly and it's in your own portfolio. Um, but when did you first know that this was a likelihood, the closure was a likelihood? Um, I hope I'm not going to say anything to incriminate myself. I, I, I spoke to the Generation Director, Hugh Finlay, in uh, October or November of last year. Um, and... Um, he explained the position that they hadn't uh, gone into the capacity auction because they couldn't make money um, uh, doing so. And um, But he, he explained that they were bidding for the supplementary balancing reserve. And I think at that time, Scottish Power's view was that National Grid needed Long Anna. I think what you've heard this morning um, uh, proves that National Grid's thinking uh, or, or their public statements have changed quite considerably during that period. So my, um, my assessment of the conversation in October and November of last year was that this was probably sabre-rattling and that a, an agreement, I felt, might be reached between the two parties. Um, the, obviously, the news flow hotted up very considerably in January and early February, and I spoke to you again at that time, and it was really only in that second uh, phone conversation when I realised that there was a very real threat that Long Garnet may close uh, as early as 2016. So it has been, um, 
if you think about the story of Longan and, and, and all the engagement that the Scottish government and UK governments had around it, um, it's not that far ago we were considering spending in excess of a billion pounds in, in, in doing carbon capture and storage at the site linked to the, the Goldeneye field um, uh, in the northeast of Scotland. Um, so that was comparatively recently. As, as, um, as Mike Clitheroe said, they've spent £250 million in recent years in pollution control measures. Um, so the, 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 I suppose part of our frustration is it does feel a little bit like dancing with a corpse, um, the, the way public policy has lurched from one side to the other um, a, a around the future of Long Anna. And that, I think, has, has, has been a compounding factor in the frustrations that the local community and the local council feel. But if I may say so, uh, I get kind of, I have to say I was kind of depressed by your comment that, you know, if this, if this shuts and here's what you're going to do, and, you know, with all due respect, we're going around the same loop that we go around very often when places, major places close, you know, we'll bring in pace and we'll create, you know, small businesses and da 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 da. I mean, what, what have you done so far since October to try and mitigate this, this decision? and you know get the community behind you to uh effectively to fight this this decision based on and based on some of the information we had previously you know there are enough holes in the argument uh, that will could have been prodded and, and certainly will be prodded so i mean wh why are we going down this road that oh, it's going to close um the, the, the council's taken very clear and robust action to, to try and campaign against the closure. There's been uh, a motion agreed at full council of unanimous support um, for the um, continuation of, of power and a, and a longer term strategy to, to clean up power generation at the site. Uh, the council leader has written to both Ofgem and uh, National Grid, uh, highlighting concerns and seeking assurances that everything is being done um, to uh, in, ensure a medium-term future for Long um, the uh, In terms of a community-based campaign, Fife has a strong record in this area, and I think the, the, the campaign against the closure of Tesco and Kakodi is, is a current live example of how the community tends to unify and come, to very, to come together very quickly with the support of, of, of cross-party groupings of, of, of politicians to campaign on this issue. And I think the fact that the Long Gannett campaign is really only starting vigorously now I think is, is a reflection on the fact that the realisation has only come really into 2015 that there is a real uh, and, and present threat to um, to the station. Okay. Given the time, I have loads of questions. But okay. Okay. Last one. Um, uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, to, to Council <coughs> Tom Adams, uh, I, I can certainly sympathise with the Council's position and coming from an area of uh, Central Region, I was a Council on Muddle District North Lancashire Council, where we had to deal with the Ravensclaig closure, which uh, thousands of jobs went, and it's actually taken the council a number of years to get back up. And I certainly recommend uh, you chase the government for a national priority, which was eventually given to Ravenscraig, and uh, also for tax incremental funding. But we don't want to get there. What you know, and the, and the question we couldn't get into ask was, um, how does the council feel about? The transmission tariff charges, you know, when you look at uh, Long Gannett is paying 17, over £17, pounds and you go to central London, and I, I love the, the, the comment by Mike uh, uh, Colville that, um, you know, central London is minus £5, pounds. West Devon and Cornwall is, is, is even nearly up at uh, nearly £6, pounds, minus £6 pounds in transmission charges, you know. Here we have uh, Long Gannett, an excellent facility. Uh, my concern is about future supply. Uh, uh, as I quoted, you were there, 2025, what's going to happen? Um, you know, where's the situation that if this closes, you know, and they're basically saying it's because of the costs and, and it's costing over £40 million pounds to run it, but if they'd done away with these transmission charges and ensured that they were equal all over the country, as it is in Europe, um, you know, is the council pursuing that? Um, I, I, I suppose um, the council is anxious to ensure that Long Island has a level playing field. I think that the, the detail of the way in which the, the transmission charges uh, play out and its impact on, on Long Island hasn't been the subject of detailed investigation because um, it, it is something that um, 
uh, is probably out with our, our, our scope as the local authority. Um, we support a level playing field and we would be keen to ensure um, that Longana can compete uh, openly on that basis. I think it is important to emphasise that the I think that the comment that, that um, Mr Clitheroe gave was that if Long Island were in the Midlands, it, it would break even. So transmission charging itself isn't the sole reason um, that, that Long Island is, is facing financial difficulties. There's clearly the carbon tax and there's the nature of the capacity auction as well. So I think uh, it's important to, to recognise that and um, uh, to be ensured that we don't just focus on one problematic aspect of, of the financial challenges facing Long Island. And I, with the greatest respect, not uh, having served in Fife Council, you have a regeneration committee, so an economic committee, that you will be pursuing the case through, and I know you have all party support on this. Uh, um, but, you know, it's a, a particular committee, there's a, have you set up a particular task committee within the council to pursue this item? A coal task force, which mirrors the, the, the Scottish coal task force, mm. which is, is largely um, taking the lead on areas like this. We have um, the, the full council debated the, the motion, which was agreed unanimously with cross-party support. Uh, and then we have an economy and planning PAG policy advisory group, which, which may wish to, to take up and look into the detail. But at the minute, it's very much campaigning mode, and uh, the, the, there is cross-party support for the campaign. I wish you well. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much. Um, I was a wee bit surprised to say that uh, it was only recently that you'd seen a, a real danger to, uh, in terms of the closure of the plant. When we, we, we've been discussing the decarbonisation of energy supply for a long time now in Scotland and the UK. There's been a general expectation that Longanet would close by 2020, and there's still no clarity that, uh, you know, a, an open debate, let's say, about whether uh, even a new generation of gas energy generation is compatible with, with the country's climate change objectives. So you've presumably been spending some considerable number of years looking at the long-term future and developing alternative plans for the contingency that there is no energy generation on that site. We, we, we were aware that the, the likely backstop date was 2023. We, we'd been planning on the basis of long Island closing in 2023, and we have, through the local development plan, um, identified uh, options for um, physical uh, business park type uh, accommodation to help with diversification. The council is strongly supportive of, of decarbonisation and um, uh, Fergus Ewing at the, the launch of the RWE biomass plant in, in Mark Hinch last week um, described Fife Council as being one of the leading councils in uh, sustainability and, and, and low carbon generation. So it's territory we're very comfortable with. Um, uh, I should have emphasised that it was the premature closure, I think, which, which uh, has taken the council by surprise rather than the closure itself. And I think, I don't think there's anyone within the council who's arguing that coal should have a long term future into 2030 or 2040. Check then at a, at a very practical level um, who owns the land uh, and who would bear the cost, the responsibility for the costs of decommissioning uh, plant or buildings? Would that fall to Scottish Power or to the council? Would it need some additional support from the Scottish Government to deal with those practical uh, issues. And also, given that, the, as far as I understand it, the land at Long Gannett itself and some of the nearby land is reclaimed through the use of ash, are there issues around contamination or other environmental factors which would limit the use of that land in future? Mm. Um, it, it, my understanding is that Scottish Power own um, the whole of the estate and that they would therefore be liable in full for... Um, the, the the clearing and restoration of of the site um, uh, uh, may well be that that isn't the case, but that's certainly um, the 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 normal approach in these situations. Our only experience is at Methyl, um, where Scottish Power closed a, a, a station some years ago uh, and demolished it four or five years ago. In that instance, the site was owned by Fourth Ports on a long term lease. Um, but as part of that lease, Scottish Power were required to clear the site and restore it in full uh, before returning it to the landlord. So um, I, I think in this instance, they own the site. Um, so your understanding of the, the relationships, yeah. that the responsibility would fall on them to clear and, and restore the land. Yes. And it would then presumably transfer? Well, it, it would transfer it, it, to the council? Or? It, well, 
you know, I, I suppose I would anticipate that if, if we did have a, a, a joint task force involving Scottish Government, perhaps UK Government, Scottish Enterprise, Fife Council um, and, and Scottish Power, um, we, we might work jointly with them on what the reuse strategy for that site is. You know, certainly given the extent of the grid infrastructure there, um, I, I would hope that in the first instance we might consider what use we can make it as part of Scotland's journey towards a, a, a low carbon uh, power generation future. So there may be some options arise from that. Um, uh, we would also want to look at whether any of the surplus estate could be turned to, to future economic use. Um, so, so is there some land that might be suitable as a business park? Um, we, we did, as part of the local planning policy work, identify a business park site, and we had a provisional agreement with a housing developer to cross-subsidise the development of the business park um, from a housing release, but um, due to, to economic constraints, that may not be possible now. So we are, we've are we identified other site options, and we would want to work through through a task force approach to, to consider how we create a, a business park and potentially get some accommodation for small and growing businesses as well. So you've not found any problems in terms of land contamination with that kind of proposition? The, the, the operator, if, if there were any, any contaminations, the operator would be expected to remediate it to, to an agreed standard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Crawford. Difficult challenge, everyone. Um, but I think there's some glimmers of hope, actually, in what's been said today. And let me just quickly explain what I mean by that, because I don't think we should give up on this being a generating site. Longana does have a gas pipeline going into it. And we heard from the representative of Scottish Power that they were considering Kakenzie for potential gas use in the future. Now, Kakenzie and the area has already absorbed the economic impact. It must have been difficult for people, but it's already been absorbed. Therefore, would it not be a common sense argument to put to Scottish Power that instead of concentrating on Kakenzie in future for gas, despite the, the issues of climate change, I understand that, that actually Longanet might be a better site for that opportunity, and particularly given that if Longanet closes, then the transmission charges be mechanism begins to change in Scotland and costs come down. So, and, and, and therefore, I think there's a real campaigning issue there for Fife Council and others to persuade them that Longanet should be the site for a potential gas in the future, and hopefully by 2020. What do you think of that, Robin? We would welcome that if um, there were a commercially viable solution to new thermal uh, generation. Um, I understand uh, very well the point that Mr Harvey's made about gas in itself not being entirely consistent with, with, with our national objectives to, to, to decarbonise electricity supply chain. It's significantly better than coal. Um, so, so as a council, I think we would broadly welcome that. I, I, I think Mr Clitheroe's comments were um, very clear um, and at the bottom end of a pessimism scale uh, about the likelihood of that happening. So I think um, Scottish Power's position, as I heard it today, was that it's dependent probably upon substantial changes in the economics of UK power generation to, to make it commercially viable to invest in any gas uh, in Scotland. But from our perspective, absolutely, I agree with the, the broad view that you've set out, the Long Island would be an excellent location for new gas capacity if it were commercially viable. And if the transmission costs were to change, that op would open up a, an opportunity, perhaps. Just quickly, if the worst was to happen, and I'm hoping we can avoid that, um, Fife, Longanet, obviously the warships work is coming to an end in the future at Scythe, potential for a double whammy on, the, on, the, on that part of West Fife economy. And, in, and, and uh, Robin, you introduced the idea of the UK government also being involved in this because it would require, I think, them to be involved given that some of the policy-making decisions, um, I'm not blaming anyone, but, uh, but by its nature would flow from decisions made from that organisation. Therefore, how important it is, do you think, in any task force that the UK government should be involved? Uh, all hands on deck, I think, in a situation like this. You know, if, if there is the potential for a thousand job losses across Scotland, and clearly each of the, of the bodies has an element of uh, responsibility um, to react to that, then I think it, it would be very welcome um, to, to secure UK government participation in that, reflecting um, their statutory role uh, uh, around energy. That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Lamont. Yes. John Lamont? No, oh, sorry, uh, Cara Hilton. Um, <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, just to pick up a bit, um, I, think, I think it's a shame that a lot of this has been 
the debate so far is focused on transmission charges when we're, both National Grid and Scottish Power have been clear that the current talks aren't anything to do with transmission charges. But that aside, um, we've heard about Fife Council, we've heard about the UK Government, but it's long been anticipated by the Scottish Government and the National Planning <coughs> Policy and other guidelines that Long Island would be closing by 2020. Do you, so do you feel that more should have been done by the Scottish Government to secure new employment and investment into Concarden and the West Fife area? Um. I, I, I haven't been actively involved internally within the Scottish Government in, in, in terms of what assumptions they've made around um, Long Anna. It wouldn't be unreasonable for them to have made the same assumptions that the Council had made, um, that the time horizon broadly we were speaking about was, was, was 2020. And um, given that we're five years from what was the previous consensus, and I think that was probably a consensus shared by Scottish uh, power, um, it doesn't perhaps surprise me that, 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 that there weren't detailed plans in place around a contingency for a likely closure in either 2020 or 2022 or 2023, which was probably the initial um, date we had in our head. Um, so the position has clearly changed very rapidly. I'm not trying to make excuses for Scottish Government or, or, or for any of the parties that have been around the table today, but the position has changed rapidly. Uh, I, I would tend to focus on what the look forward is and how we collectively work to resolve the issue rather than trying to anticipate who should have seen this coming. Um, because you know, we can clearly all take some of the blame for not having considered this as, as, a, as a contingency. Um, for me, and I think for the Council, the focus is on how do we ensure um, that the impact on Fife, on West Fife particularly, and on Scotland as a whole is, is minimised. And I think that's why the proposition of a joint task force, I think, is the one to focus on. Thank you. Any other members want to be questions? Liz McDonald. Yeah. Just, just simply in, in terms, and in, in people have talked about scenarios. In, in the scenario that the Longanet production, uh, as currently, did cease in 2016, um, clearly a task force would be would be very helpful. What uh, objectives would Five Council enter that task force with, other than clearly maintaining employment and schools? But in terms of the economic kind of model that that might look like, uh, given that we're talking only 13 months from now? Um, I, I think first and foremost we would want to focus not just on the existing workforce, uh, we would want to focus on career opportunities for the next generation uh, coming through, the ones who might otherwise have gone on to the plant uh, if, if it had a, had a longer lifespan. I think we would wish to build on the Council's very considerable investment in the, the Fife Youth Jobs contract, which has been a great success. Um, youth unemployment in Fife is, is very close now to convergence with youth unemployment across Scotland after many generations of being significantly higher and that's thanks to a very sub significant investment of around £7 million over the past three years uh, in the Fife Youth Jobs contract. So I think we would want to extend and focus specifically around the Longana area uh, around that to ensure that the next generation of young people have the opportunity to get into skilled jobs in other industries and, and clearly there are opportunities out there. Um, d despite some of the challenges around oil and gas. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing we would want to focus on ensuring that the barriers to businesses setting up in West Fife were removed. So we would want very quickly to move towards getting a good supply of employment land uh, and perhaps a small business centre, an incubator unit, um, uh, to, to, to ensure that businesses have the ability to make that first set step from working in the garage to, to working in, in, in rented premises and then hopefully expanding uh, beyond there. Um, we would want to work with Scottish Power on the, um, uh, the, 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 the commercial opportunities that might exist for construction and engineering firms as part of the rundown and decommissioning of the site. And, and clearly there will be opportunities there. And, and again, I would imagine that Scottish Power would be keen to work with us on a, a sort of meet the buyer supply chain um, type uh, assessment. And I think another part of that is, is um, a, a deep dialogue with Hargreaves and the other um, coal operators, not just in Fife, but in Ayrshire and in all the other communities that still have open cast coal, because there is a very real and live issue around what happens to, to those sites um, if uh, Scottish Power stops um, purchasing coal for Long Annet. They're, they're not, I don't think any of them are solely dependent on Long Annet, but there are, there's a number of mines which, which um, uh, do supply a fair amount of coal to Long Annet. If I could maybe yes, add into that. Yeah. Also, I think we would want to concentrate on the social impact 
such a, a large closure would have as well, because not, not only would, would you lose the jobs, but then you're looking at, for, for example, people going to work, you, you, the bus companies may be stopping buses coming in to pick people up because there ain't no employment for them. So that stops. Then, then you're not taking people into towns. So that stops maybe schooling levels sometimes drop in disadvantaged areas. We, we don't want that. So that whole social impact has to be looked at as well. Thank you. John Lavin. Yeah. I wonder what, you mentioned that it's not just an impact in Fife Council area, and I wonder what conversations you already had with other local authorities and whether, you know, has COSLA been doing any work around this in terms of the broader impact of this? I, mean, I think what you've just said around the social impact is, is so profound that, you know, it, it becomes theoretical at one level of its transmissions cost, but the actual impact directly in communities is going to be massive, and I wonder across... Is, is COSLA a good vehicle for that and have these conversations already started? Um, th th there hasn't been detailed work with all the councils. I think they're aware of the situation and we will be following up. The, the, the initial period has been predominantly focused on engagement with Scottish Power, uh, National Grid, Ofgem, um, to, to highlight the concerns, obviously engagement with the Scottish Parliament. Um, we will um, make contact very quickly. Um, COSLA could be a useful forum for, for campaigning on national issues and, and, and sort of national implications for coal. But in terms of the direct localised impact, then I think probably bilateral discussions with Falkirk and Clark Manager and the other neighbouring authorities just to, um, to, to, to exchange views and campaigning positions would, would be the quickest way to, to, to respond. I suppose it was more what resource is there in Scottish Enterprise or COSLA or whatever to support the right initiatives around employability and supporting people from one, from the actual immediate impact of jobs going to a transition into something else. I mean, there must be expertise about that could be harnessed. Yeah, it, 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 in, in terms of Scottish Enterprise, that, that remit largely transferred to Skills Development Scotland when they came into being, but, but SE will have a, a, a view from the company development uh, side of things, but the bulk of the work would be done by Skills Development Scotland in partnership with the relevant local authority and in partnership with, with, with DWP. So that tends to be the core of a, a, a PACE response team um, and, and working potentially with local colleges for reskilling. Um, so that, that's the way in which it tends to operate. Uh, DWP will uh, lead the PACE response team, but the other agencies will play in uh, and bring expertise to the table. And that, that tends to be um, uh, coordinated on a pan-local authority basis in, in a large-scale closure like this one. OK, um, if there are no other questions, um, is there anything you'd like to add, anything we've not covered you'd like to go on the record, Councillor Adams? No. OK, <clears throat> in that case, can I just thank you on behalf of the committee for, for attending, and we're well aware of the seriousness of the situation for um, the economy and the people of Fife, so grateful to you for coming, and we will now move into private session and have a short suspension. <laughs>